Jay Dyer. In the coaching castle with the peppermint rims, tripping on that candy coat. Candy coating on them rims. You can lick it. Ah, get yourself a high, dog. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know what I'm talking about. We're just talking about Riff Raff. Riff Raff, the, uh, the ultimate millennial. Uh, I got my... I got my 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 rims is coated in caramel, so you can lick it and get yourself a high. All right, everybody, we we got we got a special episode today. We're doing a little movie movie review, esoteric analysis. Jay's gonna be doing the whole stream in character as Riff Raff. So that's yeah. What's up? How y'all doing? Peppermint stripes on these bitches. <laughs> I only with hoes who like Gucci and Gabbana. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? How y'all doing today? Got that Scarface. Come to my castle. Scarface Come to my on repeat, y'all. Be- <laughs> Beatbox says, Boomer and Millennial analyze movie as sign of peace between generations. Except I'm not a boomer, but I can dress like one. You can dress like one. He's got that. Look at that hat, man. I think you got that hat specially for this occasion. I did. I need to do it like that to do this analysis, right? The bill's got to be flat. Yeah. Like, yeah. like y'all dumb millennials with that dumb flat bill. What's up, y'all? <laughs> do some movie review today. How y'all do? I could talk like Gucci, man, too, dog. Talk like Gucci, man. He was in the movie. Oh, Gucci, man. He was he was great. He I think he got an Academy Award for his performance in Spring Breakers. <laughs> Gucci, Gucci man, man was having a little bit of struggle with that acting, wasn't he? <laughs> he was like, yo, my baby need to eat. My baby's starving, y'all. <laughs> He's got like pounds of weed in front of him. <laughs> pounds of weed, yeah, and he's like... uh I brought you up. I brought you up on the streets. I taught you the game, and now you getting too big for your britches. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about two movies today. This is kind of in line with the, the theme of the social engineering of the millennial. Um, Jay and I, we both watched two movies that they got a lot in common, also very different films. They do. Beneath the Silver Lake. And Spring Breakers. So maybe we should talk about Beneath the Silver Lake first because I was just reviewing okay. some clips of that. Um, let's see, I've got... Uh, I had some screenshots. I'll throw some screenshots up as we go. But that's a film that's got Andrew Garfield, the guy who played like the young uh, millennial Spider-Man a few years back. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, how does it... I remember it starts out in like a Starbucks, right? Or some sort of a coffee shop, which is kind of the perfect millennial meeting place. Yeah, it's it's it's... It's a very strange film. It's a satire, dark satire, comedy, conspiracy movie. A lot of throwbacks to Hitchcock, neo-noir. A lot of throwbacks to old Hollywood, Silver Age Hollywood, Gold Age Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Um, And we begin by seeing this coffee shop, all the hipsters hanging out. And there's, there's graffiti that's been painted on the wall about watch out for the dog killer. So dogs are being killed we don't know why or what's going on here animals and dogs pop up all throughout the film they have all of these sort of mystical significances um they're almost like totem spirits that keep popping up and in and out well the first one that you actually see is a dead squirrel right there's a dead squirrel falls from the sky almost like an owl there's this omen right so the, the the movie starts with this sort of dark omen of this dead squirrel that just sort of pops out of the sky in front of him and from then on we know something Something shady is about to be going on. But um, let's see what I had in my notes here. I got a bunch of notes on this one. So the first, the omen of the dead squirrel, that was my first note. There's a band playing, and we see an ad for this Jesus and the Brides of Dracula band. So there's this weird mix of pop culture with religious symbolism. uh, And it could be, that could be any pop band, right? It could just be a cut and paste of any of the shit pop bands. And that's, that's interesting because... The lead singer of this pop band is going to be immediately associated with shit. Did you notice that? <laughs> you know what? I actually didn't notice that they associated him with shit. I'm, I've got the screenshot pulled up right now. Jesus and the Brides of Dracula, East L.A. Resurrected, or Never yeah. Dead. And it's this guy, like, Steven Tyler-looking dude with his shirt off. Uh, and some chicks dressed as, like, satanic nuns um, surrounding mm-hmm. him. How do they associate Well, there's that. Shit? there's a really disgusting scene where he when Andrew Garfield finally tracks that guy down to ask him some questions about the lyrics and he sneaks into the bathroom and throws the dude off the toilet and you see this big pile of shit (laughs) right next to the guy. Wow. So that's a double reference both to uh, Jodorowsky's film where the Jesus character takes a poop 
which is, you know, uh, was done intentionally, I think, by Jodorowsky to lampoon Christianity. But at the same time, there's also the 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 idea that the singer is, is essentially shitty. He's, yeah. he's not he doesn't have talent. And as we'll see, it kind of jives with the uh, Dave McGowan type research that that this band is really just a front like they get the real songs aren't even written by them. They're just a cut and paste, you know, product. And you find There's this out some... later on in the film that they didn't write any of the songs. Getting ahead and, of myself, but yeah. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to blow that scene yet because we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so yeah, so Jesus and the brides, and then he, he, the guy goes home and he's a uh, he's sitting on his porch and he's got his cell phone, a cigarette, and some uh, binoculars, and he's checking out some like weird. Yeah, he's voyeur, weird voyeurizing chip. his uh, hippie. Uh, open tittied neighbor who is feeding her birds. She's got a, a basically a zoo of birds on her balcony and feeding them bare breasted. Uh, and then he spies the babe, right? The younger chick. And she's out by the pool dancing mystically, just dancing by herself for no reason with her puppy dog. Mm-hmm. And so he starts, you know, thinking, all right, I'm going to go for that. I'm going gam- to spit some game at her. Um, I'm trying to think how he first meets her. I think he just kind of smiles at her and she sees him voyeurizing. And so these are immediate references to, uh, rear window Mm -hmm. Hitchcock Mm -hmm. because you know, the Jimmy Stewart characters broken, he's broken his leg. He's stuck in his apartment. So all he has to do all day is just basically watch all the other people in the apartments and he he gets into voyeurism. So that's a very Hitchcockian theme, the whole surveillance stuff. Um, Let's see. He then max on the chick, right? So he bumps into her. He starts talking to her. She says, hey, come over. Mm-hmm. They smoke some weed. They watch an old movie, uh, a Marilyn Monroe movie. And, and she's kind of dressed up as like a film noir, like the classic mm-hmm. film noir, yes. femme fatale kind of chick. Who Exactly. Yeah. She's the, the femme fatale. Exactly. Good point. Yeah. And uh, the movie is relevant, too, because I actually watched – I'd never seen it, believe it or not, a Marilyn Monroe movie <laughs> until uh, Jamie was like, hey, we should, we should watch the movie that they're watching. Uh-huh. And they're watching How to... Uh, Marry a what? Millionaire. Millionaire. Marry a Millionaire. Uh-huh. So that should have been a clue right away that this bitch is a thought, dude. She ain't after your low-level L.A. apartment. She's after big money, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and about, did you that, notice that they have? she has statues of Marilyn Monroe, Jane's Man, yeah. Jane Mansfield, and whoever that other woman is? Did you see that there's like code written underneath it? So there's a, uh, on the statues underneath it, there's like a card that will say Marilyn, and then it'll have underneath it, it had some strange alphabet, like some upside down T and some other symbols that looked almost like oh. English, but they were written in code. Um, I didn't notice that till I was going through it right now, taking out screenshots. No, I missed that. So, so she was already kind of, learning to speak in the code cipher speak that the elite use basically yeah so i've got i've got the uh, screenshot pulled up right now on this on this one and it's yeah it's the same um cipher type uh language that james garfield's character kind of discovers later right. on i didn't know that until i didn't notice that oh okay so uh that is interesting so she she's basically trying to learn it and then that's why when she leaves the apartment suddenly in the middle of the night she leaves that symbol right Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. Which is like two two diamonds on their sides, basically. Yeah. And he doesn't know what it anyway. means. He goes trying to figure out what this symbol means. Right. And so at the same time as all that's going down, he and he notices this weird pirate guy at her at, at her hanging out her apartment. Some some idiot hipster that dresses up like a pirate. Yeah. And he's like, "Who is that fucking weird dude?" And he's like, "Why are all your friends so weird?" <laughs> and uh. At the same time, keep in mind too, he can't pay his rent. Uh huh. So he's having he's overdue on his rent. He can't pay his rent. He goes to the landlord. He's like, "Why did this chick move out in the middle of the night?" The landlord's like, "Cause she wanted to move." And he's like, "Yeah, but in the middle of the night." And he's like, "She moved. She didn't like you. Get over it." And he's like, "Pay your rent." <laughs> so this is an interesting because conspiracy theorists, right? They're always portrayed as the guys who can't pay their rent. They get obsessed with the conspiracy. Uh, you know, they have the, the strands of yarn all over the apartment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, nothing going on in their life other than just this obsessive, yeah. compulsive behavior of, obsessed, of conspiracizing right. everything in the world. And he doesn't necessarily fit all of those stereotypes, but he touches on them a little bit, right? He's like, 
He's got his feet in the shallow. Well, he's kind gonna. Of... If you remember, his buddy, who who he meets, who's the comic book artist, is the conspiracy theorist who's way down the rabbit hole, and he thinks that guy's a nutball. Like he's like, this guy's crazy. But as the film progresses, he starts going down that rabbit hole, right? So, um, and, and what's interesting is that the whole rabbit hole is like it's laid out so that it can lead the character progressively down his little, you know, hero's yeah. journey of degeneracy right. and pop culture masturbatory. Um, you know, existence, you know, it's, and it, you know, he, he sees, where, where did he first see it in a comic book or something? It said that, yeah, he notices that his favorite, favorite comic book has th this artist has put out this comic about the silver Lake and murders in the past, uh, related to Hollywood in relationship to this Lake that's, that's near where he lives. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so basically he tracks down, yeah, the, the, uh, the artist, um, but he also notices too. This is two other points that so in the in the first chick's apartment, we see hearts and butterflies, which is imagery of like transformation, also sometimes connected to mind control. Mm -hmm. um, she sees fireworks and goes into a trance, so she's like she's mesmerized by fireworks at one bizarre. So he he doesn't understand what's up with this chick. She seems crazy. Yeah, he's watching her almost as if she's a, a television screen too, right? Like the way he interacts with her and yeah. all their even though they, you know, they have I don't think I guess they don't have sex, but they they kiss or something, right? Or they they have some Yeah, sort he of... wants to he he thinks he's going to get laid and then she's like, "Oh, sorry, uh I got to go and you need to go. We'll hang out some other time." And he's like, "Uh and they're eating crackers cuz they're stoned." Yeah, well they're they're having orange juice and and like saltine crackers, right? Mhm. Mm yeah, it's funny, in all the food culture in this movie, it's all fast food or, you know, prepackaged yeah. crap. But then they're drinking, like, expensive uh, drinks at these parties and stuff, right? And then just, you know, trash food but expensive liquor. Good point. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even think about that. But, yeah, but there's also kind of, like, he's interacting with these higher level, higher classes and, and much wealthier people. So people out of his league. Now, he's not a broke his money, he has some money, right? Because he calls his mom, she's supporting him. So that's another kind of millennial thing. Like he doesn't have a job, but he, his mom is sending him money for some reason. We don't right, know why. Right, and, and I like that scene actually when he's talking on the phone with his mom and he has no respect for her at all, right? He's got a cigarette mm -hmm. in his mouth. He's, he's uh, like basically jerking uh, off with binoculars, spying yeah. on his neighbors and just like, yeah, mom, whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah, I love you. <laughs> So, I mean, and it's such a typical generational divide that's represented there with millennials, right? Just mom, dad, give me money uh, so I can buy drugs <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and pay my rent. That's a great point. And, and yeah, and basically just, you know, screw around, uh, watch porn, you mm -hmm. know, play video games, be nihilistic, basically. Yeah. Hedonistic, nihilistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hedonism is a major yeah. theme in both of these films. and. Uh, that that one chick that he meets later. Well, we'll we'll talk about this later. Go ahead. It seems like you've got a really good um, outline right now of the film. So uh, let's see. So the so we he notices too this weird news clip of a billionaire who has supposedly died or gone missing, and he has a TV show. Um, and he wasn't just a billionaire; he was also a kind of evil can evil, you know, Super Dave type character who I don't know did some kind of jumps over buses and shit. Uh, but he's gone missing or he, he's uh, kidnapped. We don't know. So he puts that in the back of his mind. He doesn't know what's going on yet, but it's probably connected. Um, if you look at the films and if you look at his posters, they're all old Hollywood. So he, his apartment is full of old movie posters. Everything from Wolfman to Hitchcock to, to all kinds of uh, classic Hollywood. Then... Uh, let's see. Well, he's got the he's got the faces on the wall too. The the plaster cast faces. That was the conspiracy theorist. Oh, okay, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm just saying you're right though that the, when you were talking about him interacting with her, almost like she's on a TV screen, and he sees it that way. That's because he's he's viewing the world like it's a movie, like it's like it's a virtual, you know, Hollywood presentation, something like a video game. The movie itself is like a video game quest, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, hence the Zelda references later on. Yeah, and um, also he wears you know his video game shirt, right? He's got a shirt, exactly. and it's a character swimming in the water, and there's a shark underneath. I think that's what the shirt is. There's a shark underneath it, and then it says you know 100 points on the uh, the person that's swimming across oh. across the top. <laughs> you know, like he's about to be consumed by this creature that lurks beneath. Yeah, well, now, let's see. now you've noticed a whole bunch of things I didn't even notice, and uh, I gave it two viewings and still missed quite a bit of the references. So there, there's a lot here. Uh, let's see, I've got a note that says, um, 
Silver Lake area was an old silent film studio. So it goes, the, the, there's this ghostly past back uh, to the to the early days of Hollywood. Uh, and then he's 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 reading his comic book, and the comic book's based around these murders that happened a long time ago. And there's a reference to it said this phrase: "No one will ever be happy until all of the uh, dogs are dead." So we keep seeing this reference to the need for the dogs to die. Um, there was a reference to stunt dogs, and in this story, some some actor killed a dog because he got mad and jealous that the the dog the dog was getting more screen time than he was in this old he, in the the comic books referencing the, like the 20s and it's telling this story about some actor that got upstaged by some stupid dog and he so he killed the dog well, that's uh, kind so of a weird is, yeah that's interesting yeah, yeah so there's this mythology of the dog killer but we don't know why it's being put on graffiti everywhere in the present day but it also i mean it puts on the same level the dog and the actors and the people right basically trained dogs they are and- in fact yeah they what you'll notice there's a few scenes where the 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 thoughts all the millennial thoughts bitches start barking mm-hmm. they're essentially the dogs i think well, they bark um, at him right they're, they're barking yeah, at I, him. they throw him down in the bathroom one of them spits yeah, in his face exactly. and then they start barking at him uh, let's see, Eden. So, is it cursed? Is the Silver Lake Edendale? Is it cursed? Um, he has a dream of a dog killer in the park, uh, but and keep in mind, he's got Wolfman posters on his wall. Wolfman, rear, rear window, Dracula, um, and then the the two the two squares that are the symbols that she's left in her room are very. They're almost exactly the same as the the Twin Peaks symbols about. Um, that referenced the cult out in the woods in Twin Peaks. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't notice that. But there are a lot of David Lynch references in the movie, exactly. too, though. Right. So we know there's some kind of something cultic going on in the background. We don't exactly know what yet. But um, he goes to this party. They call it Purgatory. The party is called Purgatory. I'm not sure what to make of that. But there is a very conspicuous all-seeing eye at the party. So we're going to be littered with the all seeing eye imagery, classic conspiracy, you know, all uh, Egypt, you know, Pharaoh, that kind of stuff. And that's going to be the, essentially the crux of the film is, is, is spoiler alert. It's going to be about Egyptian mystery religion, essentially. That's the, that's the crux of it. But, um, so yeah, so the women are barking at him like dogs. Uh, and then he leaves this party. He's trying to get information on, what's going on and he can't figure out where this this chick disappeared to he's kind of infatuated with her and then he finds out that the daughter of the billionaire who went missing is hanging out at these parties too so he's thinking oh maybe i could talk to her um but he doesn't get a chance to the bitches in the bathroom throw him down and bark at him like you said yeah i got that picture and, i got a screenshot of the, the crazy chicks they all have pink wigs like pink hair yeah you know, they kind of dress up like the crazy feminist chicks so then uh, he he overhears these the brides of Dracula, who are the women in this stupid pop band, talking about sleeping with Jesus, who's the idiot pop band leader guy. And so the clue here is that these women are all essentially prostitutes. They're all they're all they're all they're in it for is status climbing and money. And. I think the irony here is that he doesn't pick up on this. This girl that he's infatuated with, he's not picking up on the fact that she's just one of these same bots. Yeah. <laughs> she's one of these same hoes. But he's really thinking, oh, you know, I can I can I can still uh put my time and energy into the quest, like, you know, Link and I can say Princess Zelda or something. Mm-hmm. Um Then we get this weird reference to the owl, uh, and the owl's kiss because he he's Got all these questions, so he tracks down his conspiracy theory buddy. Well, they become buddies. He's the guy who draws the comic book. And this conspiracy theory guy is, like, way down the rabbit hole. If you look in his room, there's every kind of conspiracy you could think of. Everything UFO, aliens, Templars, little figurines of Zelda. We've got a lot of owls uh, in there, too. Yeah, Owls, yeah. And so Bohemian Grove references start coming to the fore. And he's intrigued by the conspiracy guy's thoughts but he also starts thinking he's nuts because the conspiracy guy has taken it so far that he's actually referencing like you said pop culture crap food like 
it's supposed to be Flintstone cereal, but it's Space Stones, right? So he, he's like, he, he's there's these messages that are on the boxes of cereal, and he's like, this guy's like, this guy's out yeah, of yeah. The, the message he, he says something like, uh, like all everything I've been lurking, looking for my whole life, I believe, is on this map. And he shows him the map <laughs> yeah. on the back of this stupid on the box, back of a of, box of cereal, yeah. Which so is so funny, but it's like I mean, you see this a lot in pop culture now, and even in the whole conspiracy world. Remember all the. Uh, you know, like the synchro mysticism videos and stuff back in like 2012. Exactly. Um, people were getting really into finding these weird pop culture references. And basically, mm-hmm. and people started trying to make predictions about future events by watching television pop and culture. pop culture, which is so funny. They thought that in this like realm of like the whole conspiracy world, these people were, you know, they thought they were, you know, tapping into something so prophetic. But um yeah, yeah. What, what do you think about that? About that whole phenomenon back in the day? I don't know if people still do it, but that was huge. Well, I think it's a, obviously it's a way to look silly because we don't always know what is intentional and what's not. I mean, I think looking back, it's easier to figure out. Okay, there were quite a few references to nine eleven in pop culture, but yeah, I mean that's no guarantee that you're going to infallibly interpret the phenomenon in in pop culture. And a lot of things in pop culture aren't intentional; they're just coincidence or they're they're put there. Yeah, by artist creativity, but sometimes there is predictive programming. So, but again, you know, unless you know for sure the the intention of the people who put it in there, it's not really any way to know with certainty, you know, what the what the meaning is. But you know, it was another. Real but yeah, weird, it, it does. Weird. It does. Yeah, it recalls that you know, Lauren Coleman's blog, Synchromysticism. He mm-hmm. got pretty popular for a while, and um, even Hoffman in his book talks about mystical toponymy, about names and. Uh, if you've ever heard of uh, James Shelby Downard, he wrote a whole book about this very thing. Uh huh. But um, anyway, so you know, yeah, there's another funny thing in the same scene or in the same sequence when uh, they start going over the plaster faces in the wall, and the guy, uh, the character or the actor who plays this character is the same guy that was in Mulholland Drive that plays that That's in, right. in the last scene in the um, before that like weird monster bum thing pops out in the very last scene. So I thought that was a weird uh, reference, and he's kind of a similar character, right, with the weird eyes and the, you know, just bugging out, tripping out about. Well, life. this is another, yeah, another parallel to uh, to Twin Peaks and Lynch stuff. You're right. Is is the the hobos? Hobos are a network. Hobos have a king. In David Lynch, there's hobo demons, <laughs> right? Hobo goblins, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. pretty consistently throughout David Lynch stuff. So that's I think intentional. That was a. a did you catch the the weird part when he uh, where he says, "There's Johnny Depp's face right next to Grace Kelly." What did you make of that? I don't know. I I don't know what to make of it. Right. So I'm not. Let me look into this. I looked into Grace Kelly before, but it was just weird. They paused for about ten seconds, showing Johnny Depp's face and Grace Kelly, and they both kind of got a little bit tripped out by it. Um, well, she was pro- she was murdered by the uh, by the elite. I was pretty pretty certain there. Okay, she that's was yeah, she was the princess of Monaco, right? She became yeah, she was princess. dating the prince of Monaco, and there was some he had held back money that had to do with diamonds. Mm-hmm. So he was involved in some shady diamond stuff, and the elite uh, sent him a message. <laughs> I just thought out. it was so strange because you know Johnny Depp. I mean, when when you look at like kind of where he's at today and all the weird stories about him, the Viper Room, his connections with uh, oh right Hunter right. Thompson. Okay. You know, I mean, he was obsessed with Hunter Thompson, really, really right. close with him. Basically, um, you know, he just hit the the shattered psyche of Johnny Depp is kind of like the quintessential mm-hmm. uh, you know child star. You know, he he wasn't one of these kid stars who was around Hollywood for a long time. That's a good point. Yeah. I just thought it was a weird reference, you know, to uh, obviously possible human sacrifice stuff that people talk mm-hmm. about with Grace Kelly and then Johnny Depp being involved in a lot of these weird things with River Phoenix and stuff too. Um, I don't know what to make of it. It's just it seems like they were just trying to bait people to uh, to kind of think about these things. So he receive, he gets this cookie at this party and says, hey, come to the to – the, brides of dracula performance we're we're playing in a tomb <laughs> so that they're actually going to have a, a, a the band's going to play in a tomb <clears throat> but to get into this party he has to eat this cookie uh and it's a cookie that has the number 76 on it so mm-hmm. i'm not 1776 and i'm not exactly sure what the, the point of the 76 was order. the logo you know, 76 oil oil company or whatever well in california there's um, 76 gas stations everywhere too so it's, right that's that's why I'm at the gas station, the wool, wool company. Um, 
let's see. The billionaire, it turns out he was supposedly burned up in a car wreck. They found his car, and there's a hat there, <clears throat> and it's the hat of the chick. It's on the news clip. They find this hat, and it's the hat of the girl that he was first infatuated with. So now he starts to be freaked out because he's like, whoa, this chick that I was trying to make it with, she's actually you know, hanging out with this billionaire that supposedly just died. So this is crazy. What's going on? He's like, I didn't even know that I was hanging out with this this uh, hoe of the billionaire. Uh, so anyway, but I forgot, too, the other thing about the conspiracy theorist is that he tells uh, Andrew Garfield, says, watch out for the owl's kiss. And he doesn't know what that is, but it's some kind of assassin or something, kind of spirit or killer. And he says, anybody who sees the owl, uh, they know they're going to be dying soon. It is a pretty blatant uh, Twin Peaks kind of reference, right? With there the, is, and then he, and then and which, and also Bohemian Grove, and then he's, and then he shows him the owl on the dollar bill. He's like, "Look at our dollar bill. It has, uh, has an owl on it, right? Which has the all-seeing eye on it too." But mm-hmm. uh, and there, is, there really is the owl on the dollar bill is true, um, and that's why DC has that owl, owl imagery. Mm-hmm. Um, and w- owls are obviously, you know, they're kind of classic symbols for spooks. I mean, not just spooks in the sense of ghosts and demons and the way it's used in Twin Peaks. Yeah, but like, you know, intelligence. Here. But they're intelligent because they sit back and they watch. Exactly. Um, I'm not sure what to make of the Janet Gaynor stuff about how he's his mom loves this actress, Janet Gaynor, and, and she's her favorite. And that comes up a little bit later after this this uh, band performance that he goes to. But the reason I'm bringing up the band performance is because... He meets another thought at this party who was dancing with balloons and acting all idiotic. Uh, he eats this cookie because he, he said he was told that's how you get in the party is you have to eat the cookie. Well, it turns out you're just supposed to take a bite of the cookie and it's like a really heavy dose of, I don't know, MDMA. Some, yeah, or some, some sort of hallucinogen some heavy drug. or something. Some, yeah, some heavy drug. So he gets blowed out of his mind and he's trying to score with this chick, but he can't because he so ends up being so messed up. And... Well, what do you really think about wanted. the red balloon and like the whole the chick's kind of appearance? I got a picture of her pulled up. I thought that it was a very Masonic building that they go into. It was kind of like this initiation, and then they go uh-huh. underground, right? So it's like the first. Oh no, yeah, it is. It's the. I mean, the per, the party that he was just at was called Purgatory, and then he's underground in this tomb. So it's the underworld. It's supposed to be the realm of the dead. And did you see the he's, the table they sit at is shaped like a heart, but it's a tombstone, and it says Jane Mansfield on it. Oh, I didn't see that. No, I yeah, missed that. I was I paused it and tried to f- figure out some of the references and some of the stuff. And right before that, when he uh, before he goes to the party, he's talking to the guy in the weird Indian suit, and they're in front of yeah. this giant tombstone that says Hitchcock on it. Ah, uh, no, and of course, Jane Mansfield being in the Church of Satan, so that one's mm-hmm. that was an interesting reference there. Yeah, and and the chick, she's got like a bindi in her eye. She's got like a little her cute glittery plastic fake jewel for her third eye. You know, it's like this whole, you know, <laughs> fake fake spiritual thing. And then they're talking. Now this is crucial, yeah, because the 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 thoughts in the movie are bought into the ascension consciousness cult. That's going to be referenced at the end. Mm-hmm. Did you catch that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, and that's the, that's kind of the, the freakier part about it. Yeah. So, but so the the girls all believe that they're part of this secret elite network that's going to ascend, which we'll see later. But so, um, and she says, this girl says to him when they're down there, um, you know, we we've only got one life. It's just so small. Yep. Don't waste your time thinking about things that don't matter. We have our let's bodies. Yeah. yeah, let's, we, let's can just, ju- uh, we just fuck. Yeah, she says that a couple times in this really awkward way. And then she blows up a balloon. She pulls out a red balloon. She, <laughs> she blows it up like when she's talking about not wasting your energy on futile things. She pulls a fucking yeah. plastic balloon from her shirt and blows it up and then pops it with a cigarette. And then they go, <laughs> and then they go dance to an REM song. <laughs> REM, <laughs> yeah, right. I forget what song it was. And then in the middle of the dance, she goes, we should fuck. <laughs> so I just took that as millennial weirdness. Just this is the millennial them. dating ritual right here, right? Like yeah. meet at a stupid party, consume some drugs. Let's blow up some balloons. That's <laughs> hot. I have Fruity Pebbles at my house. We can go home and go <laughs> fuck and we can eat them. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's go watch the br- Let's go watch My Little Pony. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. The, 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 that's part of what makes the film appealing is the, the weirdness of all the millennial pop culture. And it's garbage it's so funny the way they interact with each other and like the, uh, 
the disconnect it's all on them. Everything is awkward, yeah. Yeah. And he's always so stoned. He's always Andrew Garfield's character is always just blazed out of his mind. His eyes are like half closed and oh, he's like mumbling. And always indecisive. So he, he uh uh wakes up after kind of blacking out after the, being drugged at this party the next day in this graveyard and he talks to his mom, she mentions movies and and Janet Gaynor, this actress from the old days of Hollywood. By the way, I looked her up. She was in uh uh, how to be a star or, or how to spot a star or something about women becoming stars in mm -hmm. Hollywood basically mm -hmm. is her, is her big famous movie. Um, and then she, um, so in other words, that's hinting at all of these hoes around him is they think they're going to be stars. They're trying to climb that ladder and it's all essentially run by a giant cult. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the only way that you get to the top is basically being a prostitute. And we're starting to learn that, Oh wait, turns out a lot of the A-list actresses, basically just slept their way to the top. This is part of the whole Weinstein stuff, right? Right, right. Uh, and this is all coming out. This film just came out during all this madness, too. And all the girls right. he's been talking to, he finds, he sees a few of them in movies, right? He ends up, like, mm -hmm. everyone's trying to get parts, right? It's just the L.A. scene. Exactly. Everyone's trying to get recognized, get attention. But everybody's just totally lost, has no idea who they are, what they're about. They have yeah. no values, no morals. Uh, the only, re like, references to... Uh, you know, Christianity or like just blasphemous. It's you know, Jesus is uh, is the head of this vampire band, and it's just it's just totally right. twisted reality um, that they're living in. Yeah, well, you're right. All the all the female characters in this movie were literal prostitutes. You find out. Well, that's what he. So he, when he he that night he leaves the graveyard. He goes to this party, which again is at a graveyard, which is interesting. So because they're doing a. The hipsters are doing an independent movie showing at the graveyard. <laughs> and so everybody's just kind of hanging out and chilling. And he's watching the movie and he sees these, these uh, you know, mediocre actresses in this independent film. And he looks over at these, this, that, pi that goofy pirate dude that he saw at the beginning at, at the party at the, the chick's apartment. And he's got these two hoes on his arm. And he's like, wait a minute he said like, that's the chicks from the movie so yeah. he's noticing like you said he's starting to see oh these, these are people in ads uh, he sees a girl on a billboard he meets her at a party he sees mm -hmm. these hoes in this uh, you know in this movie so like you said they're, they're all in the, trying to get in the scene get attention get noticed and big surprise turns out they're also prostitutes <laughs> he he's uh, uh pleasuring himself later in the movie raunchy scene but he notices in one of the dirty mags he's got he sees this ad for escorts mm -hmm. and it was the chick that was in the independent movie who was also the hoe of the pirate well yeah and the sequence that leads up to it it's so it, it's the perfect like the the whole millennials reality right so he goes home he's like stoned playing mario with his friend and his mm -hmm. friend's got a fedora on he's a uh, he yeah pull up a screen here i've got the uh he's the total skeptic fedora hipster i mean it fedoras are the atheist retards but for all intents and purposes the same type of dude yeah yeah he's he's like the standard hipster guy he's got this lame little tattoo on his arm and stuff and he's playing mario the glasses yeah he's got the glasses and uh he's got you know some video game themed sweatshirt and the dude's laying there he's stoned and he's um he's reading through this book about like code breaking or something like that yeah he starts reading about ciphers and codes because he's heard that the vampires have a a back masking uh, subliminal message in one of their records one of their songs and then he starts and listening so to the in, song backwards he starts listening he's intrigued with the idea um and so he's reading about ciphers and codes and he finds out oh this is a real thing there really are ciphers and codes and there's this important scene that a lot of people forgot because he got squirted by a skunk when he was out doing his investigations which is kind of funny because he keeps stinking all throughout the movie he smells like shit even before he got squirted and... by the skunk did you notice that there's they introduced the theme of him smelling or everything smelling in his apartment even before the, mm -hmm. the skunk stink <laughs> that's it that's funny yeah so he he uh uh he gets squirted by the skunk and then and he's having to wash in tomato juice and his halfway girlfriend that's this actress that he's just sleeping with shows up she comes over and she's like and she had noticed too when she was there a few nights before that he has these notebooks by his bed where he he's been writing about codes in pop culture but he's scared to tell anybody because he thinks you know they're gonna think i'm crazy so he keeps it to himself so then he decides to divulge this to her because he's noticed a lot more things he's like do you ever think the the elite you know live completely different and they speak to one another in codes and maybe all the stuff in pop culture is actually about something else it's not just 
you know, pop culture. It's also sending a message and maybe there's meanings being conveyed and, and maybe, you know, rich people actually run shit. And she's like, it's like, you huh? Sound crazy. You're so you sound dumb. <laughs> <insane>. <laughs> yeah. Don't you just want to fuck and eat saltines yeah. and drink orange juice? <laughs> so he can't tell anybody because you know he knows it sounds crazy, but he's getting deeper and deeper and deeper down this rabbit hole, and it is eventually going to completely obsess him. Pop culture and mainstream media are coded languages that operate on multiple levels. So he starts noticing predictive programming. He says, maybe rich people actually know things and they know more than we do. And we don't know shit. That's what he tells her. And she's like, yeah, whatever. You're insane. Um, let's see. Then we introduce the hobo characters. Sorry. So after all this, he starts tracking down this message that's in the, so the songs of this dumb band. And I forget how he breaks it, but it's something to do with like, uh, the different chords on the in the song correspond to letters or something like that. Yeah, I mean it's some it's so, some kind of schizophrenic sounding you know yeah. thing. And what I thought was funny is when he had his revelation, or like his whole revelation thing is all tied in with him masturbating. <laughs> right. So that was weird. Yeah, it's like the so the, the, the millennials that. version of like their satanic um, you know divine revelation comes through them masturbating. Sex the, magic. Yeah, yeah. pop and, culture. In fact, Crowley Crowley even said that the masturbation should be. Uh, directed energy and sex magic mm -hmm. so it's not just pleasure you're supposed to get you know enlightenment and revelation out of even masturbation so and when he's jerking uh, off he's got a he got a screen pulled up right here he's got kurt cobain poster right behind him which is uh i just always think that's interesting there's a lot of kurt cobain references there are because he's he's a big fan of nirvana and kurt cobain he almost idolizes them and that's that's relevant because when he gets to the old rich man the old rich man is going to shatter his idols. He's mm. going to tell him that his idols didn't even write their own songs. Yeah, yeah. So there's, he's jerking off, and I just thought it was so funny, the pictures he's jerking off to. It's just all these old <laughs> magazines and, like, just weird pictures. People, he's got People magazine. He's got this old version of this old Playboy that I guess he says earlier that it was his first porn or something like that, mm -hmm. right? So he's got this mythologized, you know, pornography f thing in his mind, and... uh you know, his, his revelations come when he's jerking off to pop culture, uh, you know, trash magazines that are just sitting there on his... Uh, on his that screen. is an interesting point. So it's almost like pop culture itself is masturbatory. It doesn't even have any meaning beyond just completely sterile, empty wastefulness, basically. Yeah, right. And I guess, you know, that's his procreative energy, right? Like this energy yeah. could be using to, uh, you know, find a wife, <laughs> to make children, to, uh, yeah. you know, make his, you know, maybe improve on his culture or try and, you know, somehow be, a, you know, a reason or not reasonable, but a, uh, you know, a virtuous person. It's just it all, right. get, it all gets used for chasing women, um, getting his car back and getting money and, uh, you know, just this weird chasing down of this esoteric, illusion in pop culture that ends it ends it ends like in him figuring like almost being human sacrificed himself right and actually his whole journey ends up in him almost giving in good it, point right? yeah i mean that's the thing is 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 if you he idolizes these people who are these mavens of pop culture and so he's in the scene he's hanging out with people in the scene he's realizing they're all ridiculous he's realizing they're basically just prostitutes and so he's starting to see that the 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 star making machinery is a giant you know apparatus that creates this stuff. It's not actually genius musicians who you know just rise to the top because of their amazing phenomenal talent. Right. Right. That's the mythology that that's getting crushed here. Uh, and so he's realizing it's not just about his musicians that he likes, but it's also about uh, you know the actors and the actresses in these films that he likes. So he, he's, he's realizing these codes are real. He doesn't know what to do. Um, our world is full of these codes. He starts noticing it everywhere. Billboards, video games. He's starting to see symbols, codes, right? So he's awakened in a sense. And Nintendo um, Power Magazine uh, becomes his, uh, another one of his ciphers, too. So it's, it's just all pop culture is leading him down this path to some sort of an ultimate end and some sort of realization. Right. Uh, I can't read my notes here in a couple of these places, but uh, you wrote it in cipher. So basically, <laughs> yeah. So so what this cipher tells him to do? Oh, this is the Gr Griffith Observatory. So this is important. So the cipher tells him uh, if you figure this out, go to the Griffith Observatory 
and rubbed the head of Newton, <laughs> which is a statue, a bust of Newton there, or uh, uh, or is it James Dean? It's James Dean. Okay, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and I've been to that. And if you go to the Griffith Observatory, what's weird about it is that the whole thing is super Masonic. Like, it's super occultic. Everything about the architecture, the symbolism, the whole thing is, is mega Masonic. So I thought that was significant. So he goes there, he rubs the head of James Dean, and this hobo shows up who's the king of the hobos. Um, and he doesn't know what to do. He's like, what? Is this real? The hobo says, put your blindfold on. Masonic blindfold, right? Uh, the hobo leads him to a bomb shelter underground and locks him in there uh, so he's underneath la and by the way there are reportedly tunnels all under la but um, so he's under there and he doesn't know he blindfolds he him right just like you know this kind of masonic yeah. initiation and then right and then they they see that uh they see a coyote on the way right or he hears the coyote because yeah, he's blindfolded he says uh, the coyotes we follow the, co the coyotes because they tell us more than anybody else or something, something like that. Cody's yeah. are here to help us. Or yeah, something. They're, they they're spiritual us. animals. It's got this kind of like hokey spirituality that it's this weird animistic, very sort of simple pagan type view, <clears throat> but that will come up later with, with the, with the elite, the billionaires. But, um, so he realizes down there that there, there's this giant all seeing eye above this bomb shelter underground. And he's like, what is this? And it turns out it's just an old bomb shelter that's being renovated for somebody to live down there. So he's like, what? So he follows this this hallway and he crawls up and he doesn't he crawl out of the coffee shop at the beginning? I think there's like he finds this. this yeah. Uh, well, the, the bomb like shelter is weird because there's plastic all over it, right? There's like it's got these plastic covered. Um, I, I've got it pulled it's up. Being, right? It's being renovated for another billionaire to go down there. And there's toilets. There's like five <laughs> toilets in a row at the end of the room. Um, just really weird. That's because each 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 billionaire has uh, like three or four wives. <laughs> right, right. So uh, so he's like, so there's an old bomb shelter that's being renovated. I, I don't get it. He crawls out. Uh, uh, there's a, a secret exit passage that I think lets him out in the coffee shop that we see at the beginning. There's a passage, but it's kind of like it reminds me of those old '90s videos. Remember with uh, like exploring the pyramids, like finding the secret chamber. It looks like he's you know climbing, it is. climbing to the king's chamber of the pyramid or something like that. You know, the, yeah, and he just comes up out of the like the kitchen in, in a in a stupid coffee shop. Um, it's like a, it's like it's very cartoonish in that regard. Oh, but, he comes um, out and it's and it's he's behind. I've got it pulled up right now. He comes out and he's in the milk aisle of like a convenience store. Oh, it's okay. Okay. So, and then he grabs, and this is another, like one of the only scenes where somebody, you know, consumes food. He steals, he opens up the milk and drinks the, you know, the, the milk from the, uh, the display there. And then he, <laughs> and then he takes off. Okay. So let's see. We're progressing here. So he discovers, Oh, the, yeah, this is where he gets the part where he calls his buddy and he's like, uh, it turns out the conspiracy theorist has been killed. And he goes and he looks at the conspiracy theorist's uh, surveillance cameras because he had them all set up. And the surveillance camera caught the owl, this owl-headed woman who shows up and supposedly if she gives you a kiss, that means you're about to die. So yeah. he's assassinated basically by whoever's running shit. Yeah, she kind of looks like um, an Egyptian deity or something, right? She, she looks like, yeah, exactly, an owl-headed deity of some kind <clears throat> and then sh uh so he starts getting freaked out because he thinks uh oh you know they're gonna know about me um he calls his buddy who's who's a scene guy one of the guys in the scene and he's like hey can you get me in touch with the seven brides singer he's like i need to ask some questions he's like yeah we're having uh we're having a chess party <laughs> everybody's getting fucked up and playing chess uh -huh. so come on over so they go <laughs> they go to the uh the party and everybody at this party is all the people he's been seeing the entire time throughout the movie. So it's all these hoes and thoughts from the rest of the movie are at this party. They're all playing chess, which is just to be ironic. And then, uh, he punches Dracula in the bathroom. We see the poop and he's like, who wrote your, who wrote your song? He's like, I don't write my song. He's like, it's just the company gives us those and they tell us what to do. Oh, no, uh, I think like, he says something like, oh, I wrote some of the songs, but all the ones, not the, hits. not the hits. All the hits, they they just told me what to write. Like they they told me, you know, yeah. they told me how to perform it. I don't I don't do nothing. I don't know nothing. And, and he's like, very he, he's and, he's very weak and and you know this character. He's not like this powerful. You know, he, he's he, a fraud. Yeah, he's basically just a, a an actor basically. Yeah, and he's and, portrayed on the in the 
the media in this film, he's portrayed as this like amazing esoteric, badass. like badass, yeah, like rebel, badass. like so satanic and so sick, dude. And it, but he's and, just and, he's and, just a pussy. He's real uh, total weak wussy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, um, so Andrew Garfield says, "All right." He hears something, overhears something about um, these really really rich dudes that have like their own neighborhood where they have elite parties, and he asks the redheaded actress prostitute that he saw earlier. He, he invites her over. He sees her ad calls, calls her, tells her to come over. She shows up and he's like, Hey, take me to, uh, this elite neighborhood where you had these parties. I want to see who, who's running this shit. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, she's like, you can go, uh, you can go to every house except one house. There's one house you're not allowed to go to. So naturally that's the house he wants to go to. So he gets, the hoes take him to this neighborhood. He finds this one house. That's the one you can't go to. And he breaks in and he finds some old dude playing piano, writing songs. And there's every kind of guitar, all kinds of, you know, lavish instruments everywhere. And he's like, what is this? And basically spoiler alert, the rich guy says, Oh yeah, your entire pop culture going all the way back to, 50s or 60s he's like i wrote all that he's like that's all me he's like you like nirvana i'm nirvana you like britney spear you know whatever he starts like, playing these songs these. at his piano it's just like you think that's your you think these artists actually wrote this this was yeah. all me and it, the guy, it was all created and the the stars are just the fronts they're, they're part of this machinery they don't even write most of their songs this guy writes most of the songs right this is essentially dave mcgowan type research here mm. and uh he uh Andrew Garfield freaks out and takes a guitar and busts this old dude in the head. The <laughs> guitar he that he takes is Kurt Cobain's guitar, too. So yeah, he so. takes Kurt Cobain's guitar busts because he can't fathom that the pop culture that he idolizes, that he's controlled by, the mind control is breaking down, so he just basically loses his shit. He can't, he yeah. can't take it. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, his whole reality is based on this pop culture consumption of these, exactly. you know, the music, the foods, the partying. It's all... The imagery, it's all pop culture trash. You know, I mean, it's manufactured just like Fruity Pebbles are manufactured. Mm -hmm. And um, it's all synthetic. It's all, it's essentially junk food for the mind, for the soul. Yeah. Uh, the, the pop culture is the junk food that the junk food is to the body, right? Mm -hmm. um, so he's realizing they're all hoes. They're all, it's all a scam. It's all a facade. It's all a front. Uh, I've decoded this and he's like, he, he's like, there's something behind this. So he's going to track down the billionaires now. Now he's ready. Uh, he, he figures out that, um, one of the chicks, you know, I'm sorry, I forgot. There's a whole nother level to the cipher. There's another layer of the cipher, which is the Zelda map matches up to the map of the, <laughs> in the box of cereal. And that map lays on top of the map of LA, which tells him where the billionaires are chilling in their, huts and in their fallout shelters so he decodes all this he tracks down the last one of the last places he hasn't gone yet which is some weird marking uh over by the hollywood sign right across from it and there's this hut and he goes in this hut and there's a couple of the hoes that he's seen before and this old you know boomer age white dude in there with looking like a jesus hippie type guy and they have this really awkward hilarious conversation that that's very innocuous and very silly and he's like what are you doing he's like oh uh we're preparing our tombs <laughs> it's like your tombs he's like yeah we're, we're going to ascend and he's like what do you mean he's like uh yeah we don't believe in heaven and all that stuff we believe in you know like egyptian religion like pharaohs we're going to ascend and go to another realm away from this crazy world we've already had all the pleasures and fun that we could uh so we're going to uh, entomb ourselves in these fallout shelters, uh, surround ourselves by concrete so we can't get out, and we're going to die with our three or four beautiful brides. So he can't believe this, and he's like, can I talk to you know the chick that I liked from the beginning of the movie? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, she's in another one of the shelters. Uh, let me pull her up on Skype, right? <laughs> so they pull her up, and she's like, hey, did you get a new puppy dog? And he's like, uh, you're going to die. And she's like, do you think I made the right decision? <laughs> <laughs> and the other billionaire's like, hey, 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 don't upset her. 
she's enjoying herself. So it's all very just blasé, very apathetic. Yeah, you know, life, death, like, oh, whatever, dude. (laughs) Everything is apathetic, right? Nothing matters. Mm -hmm. And even the the billionaire elites who believe in this cult, and what's funny is that the wives, they all buy into, like, the new agey basic bitch bullshit, right? That they're going, I'm going to ascend through, you know, meditation and consciousness and all this nonsense. And the billionaires are a little more, you know, Maybe this guy believes it. Maybe the other ones don't. They're a little yeah. more cynical, maybe. Yeah. They just see it as a way to, you know, a thousand years from now, who's going to know who anybody was outside of, you know, the tomb, right? If you look back at ancient the ancient world, who do we know? Well, we know about pharaohs because they had giant pyramids and tombs, right? Or maybe there's a transhumanist element to it where they think they're going to be, you know, resurrected or something like that. And, and the I billionaires, know, but... they're not like, they're not super old guys that are killing themselves. They're kind of like just past their prime, right? They're like maybe like yeah, in their 50s or something, maybe late 50s max. So they're just, you know, they're so, they're so, they've worn out all their sensory perceptions so much with all exactly, their sex, yeah, drugs, they're, they're, and rock and roll. That they're they're just blunted like, all the pleasures, yeah. They, yeah, they don't, they don't want to live anymore. Like there's no, they, maybe they don't get the same pleasure out of their their body the last, anymore since they could control everything else the last thing that they wanted to control was when they would die mm. so that they would be subject to somebody else determining when they die they, they're going to decide when they die they're going to determine the manner in which they die so it's a final kind of act of rebellion from their perspective in this kind of satanic way um but so the interesting part of that is that you know all throughout he has Notice that all of the, the synchronicities are real. The conspiracies are real. It applies to pop culture. It's a controlled top-down system. You don't rise in it unless you're compromised and a whore and all this stuff. Um, but the message of it seems to be when Andrew Garfield gets back and the reality of, the, of this world hits him, he realizes, I can't even pay my rent. Uh, my car got possessed, repossessed. He's like, what's the point, basically? Mm-hmm. And so the, the weird ending of this is this sort of millennial nihilism, this hedonism of just, you know what, I should just move in with the hippie chick that I was spying on at the beginning. You know, the, the hippie boomer chick with her boobies out. Uh, I'll just move in with her. <laughs> That's <laughs> almost like, in yeah. other words, like it's like, okay, so all of this conspiracy stuff is all true. It's very true. It's all run by very wealthy elite people. But so what? What's the point, man? I mean, I'm not saying that the movie is totally nihilistic, but it's almost like it's asking that question. Well, what is the point? No one's going to believe this. Nobody's going to go down the rabbit hole that far. It's too crazy. Uh, yeah, so it's all a bunch of hoes and thoughts. He, he talks you know. to that ki- to the king of the bums at the end, too, right? Doesn't the king of the bums kind of release him yeah, from the tomb? That. And he tells him, don't yeah. tell anybody about this or I'll kill you, basically, or something like that? Yeah, he's like, he's like okay, yeah, you figured it all out. Uh, we should kill you, but we're going to let you go. And just keep your mouth shut. And and then he fin- and then he goes home, and then he suddenly uh, decides that he wants to go back and uh, and go reconcile his whole life by moving in and, and sleeping with this old boomer who keeps birds in cages all around her house. <coughs> yeah. So so I guess this is the point where it's it's somewhat debatable. Is is the message of the movie? Uh, yeah, it's all real. Just uh, give up on it, or is the message of the movie? Don't even worry about all this conspiracy nonsense. There's no point in getting into it. It's just going to drive you nuts. Uh, just you know, enjoy enjoy the the life la- the life that you have, and don't try. It's almost like don't try to go after understanding other elite classes. You're never going to understand it. If you if you've read the there's a famous book <clears throat> called The Magus that I reference a lot in my first book. Mm. And the Magus, Magus, the Magus is a, is a similar uh, story. It's a famous literary work by John Fowles. And it's basically about some, some guy who's like, you know, this nihilistic 25-year-old uh, Oxford grad who's just kind of sleeping around, partying his way, drugging his way through Europe. And he ends up on this island uh, off of Greece called Fraxos, a made-up island. And it's owned by this Greek billionaire who's this very entombed uh, esotericist, occultist, and psychologist. And what the billionaire likes to do is set up scenarios uh, with actors, crisis actors, basically, just to test how this nihilistic guy reacts. So he's he, he puts him through all kinds of very bizarre scenarios just to mess with the dude. And um, I won't spoil the novel, but but essentially at the end of the, of the novel, it does reference him as 
a member of the Illuminati. Okay. So, so this Greek billionaire who's in the Illuminati is basically just studying the effects of his phenomenon on this, on this uh, nihilistic, you know, 24-year-old. Yeah. Uh, That's a the similar the theme, book, yeah. The end of the book is basically, what, what's the, what was the point? What were you trying to do? by Because the guy gets baited into going down the rabbit hole. He's like, oh, I'm going to yeah. figure this guy out. I'm going to expose him. I'm going to see what this is all about. And then, you know, at the end of the thing, it's like, you don't even understand that class. Like you're not in his class of elite. The same thing that Bill Har- Harford, eyes wide shut, right? Mm-hmm. He's right, like, right. I thought I was at the top of the totem pole. I thought I was the shit, man. Yeah, same idea, right? I'm the shit. Like I'm the fucking coolest motherfucker around here. Like you know, I don't give a shit about anything. And then he goes down the rabbit hole and he realizes he's not at the top of the totem pole. There's people way above him, way more powerful, way more intelligent. And it's almost like, man, what was the point? So yeah, what? Yeah. What do you think of the? Uh, what do you think the point of the movie is? Well, uh, all right. So the ending of the movie, I'm not so clear about. But I basically, you know, pop culture as a uh, initiate an, an initiation for an entire generation and for the youth and for basically everybody into a mystery religion, into a specific yeah. worldview, into seeing the world a certain way, consuming your life in a certain way, and thus just being consumed in this big machinery of pop culture and becoming a you know a piece of uh of this you know silly kind of basically nihilistic um realm and i don't know what to make of the end there's you know there's something with the generational divide right you know it starts with him talking on the phone with his mom uh oh that's staring right, yeah. at this lady through the binoculars and she's you know she's like the um she's like one of those yoga chicks like those new agey like sex magic type people who are just so free She's a boomer and liberated yeah. you know i mean lots of these boomer uh hippies kind of uh haunt the uh the, the town i live in so i'm really familiar with this type of energy you know they're really into yoga right. and uh you know mm-hmm. um uh, uh joseph campbell and stuff like that so it's no, basically when i spoke yeah i spoke in sabanga canyon and the whole essentially the whole yeah. audience was this <laughs> well right topless 60 year old women who are um, you mm-hmm. know, sleeping in a polyamorous relationship with some twenty-five-year-old dude, probably. You know, there's, there's, it's weird. Like there, there is a world of this type of yeah. uh, stuff, and I don't know what to make of the ending. So may, it's something to do with his mother, the generational divide. How I forgot per- about the mother stuff. That's a good point. Yeah, right. Perhaps yeah. how like the boomers were initiated in this very same way with the sex, drugs, they rock and began roll. this. Yeah, they're, they're the sixties counterculture, right? Right. And, and I see it as like the millennial and the boomer copulating in the end of the film basically just is, mm. you know the ultimate kind of really gross and um not very pleasant to even think about reality of what pop culture has done to everybody yes yes because the the old guy who creates all the music he is essentially he he also says all your 60s revolution music he says i created all that exactly he says, I gave you a revolution. That's why it's the boomers. Exactly. That's a good point. So it's basically boomer age to now. He says, he's like, that was all completely created from the top down. And, and the, that's essentially yeah. Dave McGowan's book. Where is he inside, yeah. inside the canyon? That's the whole point of the book. Yeah, I, I would wonder. I'm sure that whoever directed this and wrote it read those books. Um, he, he had to have. You know, he's very familiar, obviously, with the, the culture and with what people are saying about pop culture. I guess you know the last scene is him. He goes out to the balcony, and he's in that boomer's house, or the boomer's apartment, which is in the same apartment mm-hmm. complex as him, right? So, him right, just right across, yeah, yeah. So they're in this same curated environment that they don't own, right? You don't own your apartment. You live in an apartment building, and he's smoking a cigarette around these birds in the cages, and he's watching the. I guess it's like the cops or something. Or no, it's the apartment. Uh, the guy who owns the apartment is looking at the weird symbol on the wall. Um, and and trying to figure out, well, where did this kid go? He owes me rent or he owes me money or some shit. And Andrew Garfield's kind of looking at him really like creepy, stoned, demonic gaze. And then I think I think it rolls rolls the credits after that. Um, I was trying to remember. Yeah, this is the guy who did It Follows, which is a pretty good horror movie if you saw that. David uh, Robert Mitchell. I have to check it out. <coughs> um, it Follows was pretty good. It was pretty creepy. Um, and the idea there was. Uh, similar to this in the sense of the uh, uh, millennial age people living hedonistically and are there consequences for that? Um, and then if you know, it's like the uh, uh, urban myth of 
something coming after you, you know, like it's going to get you that kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, and I have I've watched it falls a few times and there's a bunch of references to Dostoevsky in it. So I'm not exactly sure what I think the reference to Dostoevsky means, but uh, it's a pretty good horror movie if you like independent. Not it's not gory. It's just kind yeah. of creepy. Yeah, no, so, I'll check it out. So he's definitely referencing you know literary works Dostoevsky. Here he's in you know this one he's referencing a lot of David Lynch. Um, and by the way, I, I had actually messaged the chick that's in It Follows. We had a few uh, messages on Facebook. I was trying to get her to come on and do an interview, mm-hmm. and I thought she was going to do it, but she ended up backing out. But uh, I would I, that would have been interesting because because I've only had one actress ever come on uh, Jay's analysis. They're always too I guess too scared. It's going to damage their career. <laughs> yeah. But it would be funny to get the vantage point of somebody who's you know in the film to see. Yeah. Yeah, the, I, I, what do you think about the movie overall? Do you, do you enjoy it? I mean, it's kind of long. I think it was a little lengthy. And... It is long. I, that doesn't bother me. I enjoy the use of symbolism, the use of satire. It's very comedic. It's funny in a lot of places. Yeah. Um, overall, it's a great critique of, as you said, all the nihilism, the hedonism, consumerism, um, the video game vantage point of the millennial generation. Right. Voyeurism, the, like de- total detachment yeah. from yourself. Detachment. Right. Uh, Synthetic reality. Um, what exactly the ending means is up for debate. I'm not sold that my interpretation of it is right. Mm. I'm not sure because I didn't even think about the boomer, the, the age gap stuff. And it's not just the age gap. It's also class. Like he, he's he's trying to because we forgot about the billionaire's daughter. Like he's yeah. trying to step into the world of the billionaires. And he he has this date night with the billionaire daughter. Right. They go swim pool she's topless he thinks he's gonna get some and uh she ends up getting shot right so he's like realizing there's bigger players at work than him you know do i really want to be in that world you know so yeah yeah i think the apartment it's kind of interesting right so it's the building that you don't own and him and this the old boomer hippie lady they both live in it but separately and eventually through the process of the movie they come together and they basically are living in the same place he can't afford rent so he's over there in the boomer's place where she's got all these birds right. in cages. And so, yeah, I mean, it's definitely social engineering and there's a lot of themes in it. I, I feel like a lot of these directors, sometimes they don't even understand why they put certain things in it. Right. It's like, well, that, that feels mysterious. <laughs> Let's do that. Yeah. I don't know if you saw neon demon. I, I felt that way about neon demon. It's talking a lot about uh, Hollywood being this machine that eats people up and spits them out. Mm-hmm. And it's got witches in there and they're doing rituals. And then, you know, the, the, if you spoiler alert, the chick, the model gets killed at the end and basically eaten. Oh wow! Uh, and and you're just like, what? What does this mean? Well, you know, it's all nihilistic, and they're laughing at the end, so it's kind of like, oh, it's all a big joke. And yeah. like you said, like he's got all this stuff in there that's significant, but what does he even know what it means? You know? Yeah, and then, of course, video game culture was really big in this. You know, the the food was all you know. Uh, the, the imagery on the boxes the food, of cereal. You that. Yeah, right, like the foods they eat and stuff. It's just somebody shows up. His girlfriend shows up in the beginning. Or not his girlfriend, but some chick who's, he, uh, you know, they they use each other to masturbate. Um, she comes over and she brings sushi. Right? And then she's like, yeah. oh, this, room, this whole place smells. And they eat sushi. And then he eats like saltine crackers and then basically yeah. beer and cigarettes for the rest of the movie. Uh, <laughs> that's like all and they a- consume. A cookie, yeah, it's all junk. Oh, and then a cookie point. that sends him on this psychedelic journey too. Right, a sugar cookie. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, which it's is just... kind of Alice in Wonderland too. I didn't even think about that's Alice in Wonderland. Uh huh. Uh huh. And it was that scene was very similar to Eyes Wide Shut too. When he walks in, they use a similar camera angle, walking behind him, just like Bill Hartford. Um, right. So yeah, I, I enjoyed right. it. I thought it was pretty good. I think. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, it, it was kind of long. I was tired when I when I watched it, but then when I looked through it and uh, scrolled through it later on, I thought it was. You know, it was pretty well put together, entertaining. Andrew yeah, I think the most, the, the most important takeaway was the pretty clear revelation that, you know, the pop culture is, is manufactured. That was the best scene. No. The best scene was the yeah. old man telling him, look, your whole reality is false, and I wrote all these songs, and none of these are real stars. I like that one. Yeah. Um, so uh, before we do Spring Records, uh, i got to take a pee break. Go for it, man. I'll, I'll read some super chats here. Um, okay. Let's see here. Oh, Nick Jones. What's up, Nick Jones? That was at the very beginning of the stream. He says, thanks, both of you. Hands down, my two favorite channels on YouTube. Love the book, Jay. Thanks. Right on, Nick. Did you get the second book, too? 
I haven't got Jay's second book yet. My brother, he's flying out here. I sent it to him. He's going to bring it with him. So I'm looking forward to reading Jay's next book. Uh, his second book, Esoteric Hollywood 2. Um, yeah, he, his website, Jay's website, by the way, one of one of my favorite sites. One of the very few sites that I actually pay for uh, – uh, for a you know subscription to he does lots of theology uh, lectures and he's got such a wealth of um, of like just such a huge back catalog of essays on everything from history geopolitics uh, theology I think the theology section is a real gem of his website too and uh, of course you know esoteric analysis of films and whatnot so check out his website guys. In memory of John Mordaunt says, uh, my boy has less SPD symptoms with real food. Thanks for all you do. Right on. Thanks a lot. You're a regular viewer. You're always jumping in here. Bob Monk, he sent, he sent some money, but he's not even asking anything. Right on. Um, infinite microsecond. I'll, uh, I'll ask that question when Jay gets back. Thanks for the, uh, the super chat, man. Sending 10 bucks. Doorman says, thanks for the stream, guys. Showing some love. Eat me, make families. And hashtag... Bald man bad, and hashtag beard man bad. Well, thank you, my friend. I agree. Hashtag bald man bad. Hashtag beard man bad. Now, let's see here. Uh, Tyler Sutton says, two of my favorite YouTube personalities. Be sure to share with Jessica. I appreciate her answering my emails. I would like Jay to do more on his channel about the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. All right, I'll, I'll let Jay know you said that when he gets back. And then Sir Deluxe sends five bucks without any, without saying anything. Thanks a lot, man. Get this mosquito flying in my face. Um, Las Vegas Carnivore, what's up? Alex the Carnivore, Tyler, Tumble Bear, Metal Slug 17, bunch of people in the chat today. Uh, let's see what's going on. we got a much smaller audience than usual. We're doing a fun little stream today. Um, no clickbait titles. We're just doing some film analysis and having fun. Um, talking about some some funny millennial movies. Funny millennial movies. Mike's in the chat. What's up, man? Um, so yeah, next we're going to talk about Spring Breakers. Spring Breakers, which is actually a very... It's like a horrific movie. Spring Breakers is a horror film also. Um, probably one of the more haunting films that I've seen over the last decade. I don't know why, but for some reason... Spring Breakers really, like, disturbed me <laughs> watching this film. It was just, there was something about it, something about the aesthetic of it, something about how this movie was made, how this film was made, that is just really um, haunting. And it is so, it's so reflective of the, uh, the millennials' pop culture curated world. Jay's back. What's up, Jay? Hey, we, we had one super chat. Um from somebody asking, is yoga acceptable in Orthodox Christianity? So is yoga cool with Eastern Orthodoxy? What is the stance on yoga? No, uh, traditional yoga involves, you know, uh, Hindu practice and, you know, Kundalini opening of the serpent power force in the spine. Uh, you know, Crowley was a big proponent of blending yoga with Western thought. Uh, so uh, it's intentionally done to invoke deities. Uh, now, Pilates, stretching, anything like that, obviously, no, not. Uh, that's fine. But uh, yoga itself, uh, no, is, would not be compatible with, with Christianity. Yeah. yeah. It's funny how popular yoga became. It, it really got big in the U.S. after the 60s when you had the huge Crowleyan push. And uh, and the Beatles pushed it, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, so... I mean, who brought? Who really popularized yoga in the West? Was it, it almost seems like Crowley was the guy who really brought it out in the West. Yeah, I think you can make that case. I mean, the Chicago World Fair of Religions in the 1890s featured this the first uh, yogi trying to introduce the, the idea to the West, and what that was was kind of the, the pioneer uh, uh, ecumenical service. Yeah, it was how do we get all the religions together in the West? And it was just a form of social engineering. It was being promoted by the elites. Uh, after the 1890s into the 20th century, you had uh, Swami Vivekananda, or uh, uh, Sri, um, 
I forget. I get all these. I think it was Vivekananda or something, right? Yeah, Vivekananda, and then there's another guy who's. Uh, they started also simultaneously pushing the New Thought movement, and that turned into positive thinking, and uh, all those forces coalesced in you know the New Age movement with the Esalen Institute and all that, and uh, so there's always been big money behind that that. Right, of right. So it's not like like actually moving your body and you know stretching out your legs or you know even it seems like that that maybe isn't so bad. But when you <laughs> connect it with all these other ideas and the you know the uh, the pranic breathing, breathe the prana into your body and all this stuff, it it definitely gets pretty deep into some Hindu stuff. Well, you're supposed to you're supposed to put your body into. It's kind of like the way Hindus do the ritual dancing. You're putting your body into the god forms. Mm. These are God forms that are intended to invoke the energy of that of that God. And so ultimately, no, that would be that would be demonic because the purpose of all the Eastern meditation, uh, which is pretty ridiculous, is to uh, annihilate the ego, to annihilate the self. Right. I mean, God didn't create you as an individual person to annihilate the you. Right. You're not supposed to annihilate the you and, and, and dissolve into the, the oneness of all being and nirvana. That's not why you were created. So ultimately, all the Far Eastern religions are satanic at root. There you go. It's a pretty in-depth answer there. Um, somebody said he wants to see more Jordan Peterson stuff on your YouTube channel. Tyler Sutton says Jay's got to do more on Jordan Peterson on his YouTube channel. I would say, as far from what I've heard Jay talk about the Jordan Peterson phenomenon, he's kind of said what needed to be said. I don't I mean, know. How many times do you have to critique, you know, Carl yeah, yeah. Jung and evolution <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, there's not much there, there. It's pretty, it's pretty fat, it's shallow, thin stuff coming out of Jordan Peterson. It's yeah. Very... And if you look at Jay's website, when you have so much stuff on critiquing classical liberalism, critiquing, um, you know, the liberal imperium. Uh, so mm. yeah, maybe if you guys sign up for his, uh, member section, which is, Really cheap. Is it sixty bucks for the year still? It is four ninety five a month if you want to do it monthly, yeah. and um, growing archive. But uh, there's about three years worth of backed up archive material back there. Lectures on Plato, lectures on tragedy and hope, you know, globalist books, all kinds of stuff there. What would you theology. say would be like a good avenue of research? Even going through your website for some people who are interested in deeper stuff. What kind of keywords would they be looking at, and what type of um, you know what what aspects of philosophy and history would they want to look at if they want to uh, to see what your views or uh, expand on um, you know maybe the critique that you've put out there on Jordan Peterson's philosophy and his ideas. Um, but particularly on Jordan Peterson, I would say the 30, 40 minute video that I did that's a critique of him. That's a two parter. Um, that's had about twenty five thousand views. That's probably the best one. Um, which is funny because when I did that video, the likes to dislikes were about equal. It was like, <laughs> I don't know, 200 likes, 200 dislikes. And, and in the last year since I did that video, a lot of my critiques have been vindicated. A lot of people have abandoned the Peterson cult. They've realized that, you know, he started cucking pretty hard. He came out against men, you know, came out against in individualism. He's supposed to be this great individualist. And saying all these really contradictory things. And uh, so people started, you know, I think realizing that he's not all he was cracked up to be. Oh, it turns out he's invited to the Trilateral Commission. He's speaking there. You know, he's obviously an establishment creation. Fox yeah. Day did a whole bunch of critiques of him. Um, so now the, the likes to dislike ratio is like 700 to 150. So mm. so it's it's uh, evened out, I would say, public opinion. I think it's there's still a lot of norms. And you were one of the there. first people who actually critiqued uh, Peterson's philosophy, right? I mean, everybody was so enamored. That's and why you're I made like, everybody so mad. Yeah, yeah. It's like I, I had a critique, and then right around the same time, Vox Day started critiquing him. And then um, I think Owen Benjamin critiqued him after that. So, yeah, he's gotten <laughs> yeah. more and more critiques. But but uh, So I would say that video. And then Tim Kelly and I have done two talks where I, where I critique the Petersonian worldview. Yeah. And... Um, He's come up in other shows too that I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Peterson, he's, yeah. he seems like a guy who's you know he's like a he's a boomer, he's an academic. It's it's probably very hard in that situation to see outside of that box at all to ever critique the roots of classical liberalism or Darwinism, Marx or not Marx, but uh, um, uh, Jung. Um, Carl Jung's Gnosticism, yeah. I mean, Jordan Peterson is essentially just a modern day Gnostic, a modern day originist, a modern day. Uh, um, um, catch all. It's like a, it's like a cross between Tony Robbins and, and yeah. you know, 
I mean, Vox Day had a good point about his uh, rules for, for life, the Jordan Peterson rules for life. And they're all about you getting ahead. Don't worry about associating with people that don't advance your personal, you know, uh, name and brand. And it's, it's just, just marketing bullshit, really. Yeah. Tyler Sutton says, I'm going to send a local Serbian Orthodox church to get a feel for it. That's awesome, man. Good for yeah. you. So you're, you're lucky, man. You're good. blessed because I've got a 16-hour drive, and it's not even an Orthodox church. It's just like a small uh, uh, Orthodox uh, congregation. Uh, the, they don't even have a church building. It's we're, a 16-hour drive from you? 16-hour drive, yeah. But I'll, wow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up there soon. It's still worth it to me. But um, wow. yeah, it's it's uh, we're in Catholic land down here, man. Now, oh, now we, yeah, yeah. we got the That's Pope. Right. We got the Pope talking about got to get rid of <coughs> nations and get rid of your borders. Have globalism. It's so great. Oh man, yeah, we're kind of we're kind of you know you you think when you're we thought when we were, when we came down to Latin America that we would maybe get a couple generations until it all came full flood, but then the the cell phones came and the uh, the smartphone came out. Oh, uh, cell phones changed everything. Globalism yeah, man. Right there. Now yeah, they started. Uh, now they're trying to bring abortion into Ecuador. Um, wow, really? Yeah. Well, that's you know slowly they have to bring it in slowly. So that's like, mm-hmm. oh well, what if a lady gets raped? Then you gotta get the abortion. So maybe that's good. Um, but yeah, they, the Ecuadorians are still very much against it, but Hey, you know I mean? It's, um, they're trying, they're going to do social engineering to try to, you know, yeah, 10 years, probably max change opinion within 10 years. Yeah. yeah but abortion will be the a rite of passage for all women in 10 years. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. it's sad. I hope not, you know, God forbid, I, I hope not. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a lot of these people end up, uh, leaving the Catholic church with, uh, with the current Pope. I, you know, I mean, I got no problem with Catholics. I live in a Catholic country. A lot of good things about what uh, Catholicism has done to maintain, you mm-hmm. know, family unit, uh, to keep some forms of degeneracy out of Latin America. But, right, you know, I mean, you, with what this Pope is saying, it's getting pretty alarming. Yeah, it is sad. I mean, I think uh, he's going to be, you know, it's going to be more and more evident that that he's a uh, definitely a tool of the globalists and and. Roman Catholic Church has unfortunately been on that track, that path for, you know, many, many decades, at least since Vatican II and, and mm. before that as well. Yeah, right. Well, even, yeah, then when you look back further, it seems there were a lot of things that were uh, just not quite right. Well, the whole Popeism thing has always been weird. But anyways, that's uh, that's cool. Let's, let's uh, we got through all the super chats there. A few other interesting questions, but it's kind of off topic. So uh, got a lively chat today. Got no trolls today, too. My, my, I got a band list. Uh, I got a miles long band list on this channel. Yeah, me too. I mean, love it. Yeah. I have no patience for any of that stuff. No, I mean it's like, look, you're gonna derail the chat and turn it into something like it, it gets so annoying. You cut, you pop into the chat, and suddenly everybody's talking about flat Earth. You're like, dude, I have no problem with you people believing in flat Earth. It's all good. Question everything, but please don't come and debate it in my chat when we're talking about nothing to do with it. Talking about something totally different. Yeah. Yeah. So. We got a good chat going on now, but uh, yeah, what what do you think about Spring Breakers, Harmony Corinne? It wasn't what I expected. I you know, I remember when the movie came out, and uh, I wasn't intentionally avoiding it. I just happened to miss it at the time. I've seen other Harmony Corinne films. Uh, you know, I remember when I was in high school. I think my senior year is when Kids came out. Kids had a, a pretty big impact, and it was controversial at the time because it was a Disney film. People, I think it was Miramax, maybe, or or one of the Disney subsidiaries did Kids. And it was, you know, pretty brutal. And, you know, it's about AIDS, transmitting AIDS amongst my generation, Gen X and, you know, nihilistic partying Gen Xers back then. Spring Breakers is his treatment of millennials. right? So, again, we have this theme of the mindless millennials, totally hedonistic, totally wild, savage. um, And the thoughts. I mean, this is about heartless millennial thoughts. Yeah, uh, and I, th- I, like, I liked your point that it's a horror movie. I, you know, I didn't think that. I thought this was a goofy satire, silly thing from the trailer. And then when when I started watching, I was like, "This is a gangster movie," and then I realized, <laughs> "Oh, it's more of like a horror movie." <laughs> it's really horrific, right? And it, you know, even when it starts out, so it starts out the first scene. First of all, it, it starts out with just saying it's a "Spring Breakers," and it's got these glittery, like, um, yeah. you know, really pretty. Um, pink and blue and the colors so uh, neon and pastel um and it starts out with just kids dancing 
and like an MTV style. Um, it is. It's very uh, nine uh, late nineties, mid two thousand, early two thousands MTV when they would broadcast Spring Break. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So they start. They, the kids are dancing around. Let's see. I've got a. Uh, I've got some screenshots pulled up here. Um, there's beer bongs and they're pouring beer all over each other and uh, it's just really it's really gross like it's very off putting it's very disgusting um, it's kind of sad to watch and it's got this like Skrillex song like do 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 this industrial sounding music and then it shows the first shot of somebody actually consuming. Um, it's just, they're they're drinking beer. They're pouring beer all over each other. Um, it's just debauchery. Yeah, it's like total debauchery. Yeah, and it, it's really gross. So then, and then it, you know, there's this chick, and she's sucking on a red, white, and blue um, popsicle, right? Like that's the American, the colors of the American flag. The American a, pop. Yeah, right. And it's slow. rocket pop. They call it rocket pop. <laughs> that's what they are. So that food, that thing shows up like three times in the movie, or at least two times. Um, one of the few foods they eat. In the movie, and they're, they're pouring. The guys are like standing around, fake pissing beer into girls' mouths. So there's a line of women or young girls, and they're naked, or topless, and they're going like this. And the dudes are acting like they're peeing the beer into their mouth. So it's just this really gross representation of you know bodily fluids and just consuming poisons and um, really destructive behavior and hypersexualized behavior. Uh, and then it cuts, and it, it's got this the audio in the background. Or the, um, it's got a, this dialogue from like a preacher, right? This, um, yeah, this, this idiot boomer evangelical preacher wearing Ed Hardy gear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's got like Ed Hardy and like an affliction t-shirt, you know, yeah. um, tattoos and chains and stuff. And he's, he says, we're going to talk about temptation. Uh, we're, we're going to talk, talk about temptation. Yeah. We're, we're going to talk about Satan. And right when he says we're going to talk about Satan, it cuts to this girl smoking a bong and it's, you know, there's red, lit dorm room um totally weird uh set up everybody's just passed out yeah yeah everybody's high everybody they're watching uh they're watching are they watching the bronies is it like a bronies reference they're watching my little pony yeah they're watching my little pony you can't exactly and then the the girl that shows vanessa hudgens is like a do you know about her is she a disney chick like well, there's, she's a Disney chick. Selena Gomez, I think, was a Disney chick, too. And the reason that's relevant is because, like I said, Kids, Harmony Korine, that was that was a Disney movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's almost like Disney is telling us. I, did you ever see that weird movie, uh, Escape from Tomorrowland? No. Is that a Disney movie, an yeah. actual Disney movie? Well, <laughs> no, no. But it's hard to see how it couldn't be because supposedly they snuck into Disneyland to film an entire movie. Come on. Yeah. Right. I don't <laughs> buy that. So, uh, uh, but to escape from Tomorrowland is about basically, uh, the dark side of Disney. I mean, it deserves its own whole video cause it's pretty deep, but, uh, it's kind of the same thing with Harmony Corinne in the sense that, I mean, I don't think he works for Disney, but I'm saying, um, you've got these two Disney princesses here, right. Yeah. Who are essentially, portraying that uh madonna horror complex and even the selena gomez character who's this this uh naive sort of simple evangelical chick who is tempted to go down with these hoes from her small town to spring break like spring break is supposed to be you know this immortality state this eternal it's almost like they treat it like heaven like it's gonna we want this forever spring break forever exactly exactly that we we just want to get out of our right reality we got to get out of this place we've got the same thing happening every day we hate it here it's so boring we got to go to spring break but we have no money and that's their issue the ch- these little girls they have no money and then one of them is selena gomez who was that was justin bieber's girlfriend for a while yeah um, so she's exactly. like this huge pop culture uh figure and it shows her, and she's like in this kind of weird evangelical church situation, and everybody looks really empty there. You know, she doesn't she doesn't seem very happy. And the childishness they have them all singing like the clap your hands, you know, hey, Jesus loves you. Clap your hands. Hey, yeah, it's very yeah, and it, and it's it's funny because that contrasts with it's kind of the same thing that they're doing there as the girls are doing at spring break, right? Hyping themselves up emotionally, and um, mm-hmm. you know, singing singing empty empty songs with uh that they don't really feel have any meaning exactly yeah and and i I, the irony of that was i'm sitting here thinking there's no way that the 
the cheese ball indoctrination of charismatic evangelicalism that she's involved in is going to is, is is not going to be enough to hold her back from the degeneracy when she gives into the plot, right? So yeah. her 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 hoe friends are like, "Let's do it. You got to be hard. You got to be hard." So you have these, you know, 17, 18 year old white girls who well, I guess they, have they been, should be eighteen because they're the first year of college. So they're, they're okay, eighteen. So they've been completely downloaded with the idea of like hardcore, you know, rap that they're hard and they're gonna they got to show how hard they are, and they come up with this plot to to rob like a little diner, which I don't know how they. I don't. I can't imagine some little diner in a small town having enough money to fund like this. You know. Well, how much would they really need, right? They're trying to get on a bus. Go. Yeah. They all they need to do is get on a bus, go get some cheap hotel room on the beach in Florida, and buy some booze for a few days. But I guess I mean, since they're girls, they don't have to buy booze. Like everyone will just shower them with drugs and, True. and alcohol. That's a good point. So maybe they don't need. Yeah, that and much I, money. I couldn't tell whether it was Daytona or or uh, it was Saint Pete's. Oh, okay. St. Petersburg, okay. Uh, Florida. Yeah. I, I thought that was uh, the intro to the film was is actually really interesting because it the way it juxtaposes the the partying and then goes straight to the evangelical like you know mm-hmm. children's group. Uh, they've got the Bibles in front of them, but they're not reading from it. They're just singing empty songs and stuff like that. And then it shows the girls in their class and they're while they're learning about like the reconstruction period during the civil war in the lecture right. they're drawing pictures of dicks and uh showing <laughs> and and pretending to lick them and, and saying i want penis <laughs> uh, so i got a screenshot pulled up right there where she says she got a heart and says i love penis on it yeah so penis. they're miserable in their small town and hypersexual like, uh, you got to be hard don't be scared of nothing let's let's rob this uh Mom and Pop Diner. Would you notice the party? Uh, I, I, there was some really shocking imagery in the party they went to, right? So it shows this, this, uh, this kind of college party, and the first shots it shows of it are all them sitting around a bonfire, right? So it's it shows it shows Vanessa Hudgens smoking a bong load after they say right. we're going to talk about Satan, and then it switches to her and she lights up the thing, and so there's the fire, and then she breathes in the the weed smoke. There's a lot of references to breath right like breathing in and they huh. breathe on each other a lot in the film like they blow smoke uh, in each other's mouth huh. um there's quite a few scenes with just referencing like inhaling you know which would probably be referencing spiritual uh, uh mm. you know god breathed the spirit of life into Adam. right good point so it's like this no, i didn't even notice that because i've only seen it once so my first time through i'm just looking at you know like the basic level of yeah. Of uh, the plot line. So a lot of the symbolism I miss because the way I do movies is I'll watch them. If it's a good one that I feel like has a lot of a depth to it, I'm going to watch it two or three times. Yeah. And you'll notice, you, you know, you pick up stuff the more that and some, some movies you can watch five times and you still haven't even picked up everything. But yeah. But yeah. So that was a good point. I, I didn't even notice the breathing uh, stuff. Um, There's quite a few references. To that. Then they, they show they, they're at a party. They're at this college party, and it's just – it definitely reminds me of a lot of the, you know, the parties I saw when I was in college. Uh, right. Um, so you, they're pouring beer bongs down baby doll. They have this setup where they, they have a baby doll, and the beer bong goes through the baby's mouth and out of its where its genitals would be. And the college kids are doing beer bongs through this baby doll. So it's just – it's referencing, right, child abuse, uh, you mm-hmm. know, force poisoning children. Um, yeah. Well – one of the one of the lines that one of the thoughts I think it was Vanessa Hudgens she says, uh, "quote She's like, we got to do this. Don't be scared of nothing. Act like you're in a movie. Act mm. like you're in a video game. You got to be hard." <laughs> exactly. So her whole worldview is programmed by video games, rap music, and movies. There's even you know there's even a shot I've got it pulled up right now of a guy smoking weed through a baby doll. So he's the we the wow. the bowl of weed is in its mouth and then he's sucking it through where it's like. You know, where it's gentle. It's really horrible imagery. You barely notice it. There's baby dolls taped to the wall. There's a guy with a dead chicken on his head, and he's smoking out of a bong. So it's just really gross imagery. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then they start discussing what they got to do. Right? We gotta, we gotta get this money. We gotta get this money, y'all. And um, it shows him snorting coke, which is like, right. you know. And then she, she has a gun. The girl actually has a squirt gun. Do you see that part? She's got a squirt gun. She squirts the yeah. Liquor she's in her like. Mouth drinking alcohol and sucking on it like it's a PP, which comes up later in the growth scene with James Franco sucking the guns. Like oh, PP. man, I forgot about that. That's one of the that most was, disgusting like, oh. things ever put on film. James Franco <laughs> filleting a gun. Two guns. So bad. 
Um, yeah, James Franco, true degenerate. <laughs> um, and and a big devotee fan of Crowley too, by the way. Exactly. Yeah, yeah he he directed, he, or he him and Kenneth Anger are real good friends, aren't they? Good point. Yes. Um, my next note uh, says uh, that we see him rapping, right? And he's called Alien. So he's, he's like, this I ain't from rapper. this planet, y'all. He's <laughs> like, I, I ain't from this planet. I'm here and uh, I'm going to take you to another world and all this stuff. Uh, almost like he is, like, an, like he's another being, like another. I see him as almost like a devil type character because mm-hmm. uh, he. What happens is, of course, they go, they they party hardy, and then they end up these two t- gross twin dudes with, with uh, you know, grills. These two Ooh. skanky white dudes trying to be thugs. Yeah. Uh, they're supplying their party with with drugs, and they end up getting arrested. Right, so the girls all get arrested, and we almost think it was kind of by design because the two the two white dude the two twins were at the party bringing the drugs. Mm-hmm. They're working for Riff Raff, <laughs> for yeah. Jeff Franco. Yeah. Really. Uh, and so he busts them out of jail, and he's like, ah, oh, what's up, y'all? I just want to be nice, bust y'all out of jail, you know what I'm saying? Uh, why don't y'all come chill with me? What's up? And then he starts immediately, hits them with like, <laughs> you know, Mm. Y'all ever had a double double dong inside? Yeah, you? yeah, no, he's, yeah, that was so yeah. gross. Well, well, f- first, what happened though is they the girls robbed. You, you mentioned this; they robbed a diner to get some money. Um, they had, but it's not Faith. So Faith is Selena Gomez's character, who's kind of the more innocent girl. Like she doesn't really want to be doing the drugs, but they're like, here, smoke this. You know, here, take. So she's, but she has nothing to to fight it with, right? She, there's no real resistance, even though you could tell she's not sold on it. She has no resistance, and you you kind of nailed it when saying, like, you know, her worldview, because she's not connected to anything spiritually strong enough to oppose it, she can't. Yeah, it's 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 very childish evangelicalism. It wasn't it wasn't uh, enough to to convince her that this degeneracy wasn't appealing, this pure hedonism wasn't appealing. So she falls into it, you know, pretty quick. But she's the one that starts having reservations because she does have at least some moral compass. Her friends have no moral compass whatsoever. Right, right. And, they go uh, to this party. They once they finally get to spring break, they're just doing drugs. The chicks are, they 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 become very kind of demonic, especially the blonde exactly. girls. Um, so it's yeah, just they have no, no nothing human human about them. They're just completely. It's just evil after evil after evil. Right. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, there was that scene in the in the room where they're they're doing coke and stuff at this party, and one of those twins. Who the twins? Do you know who they are? They're actually like internet celebrities. No, I didn't know that. Those twins—they're called the ATL twins, um, and they're like—they're actually they're paralegals out of Atlanta, um, <laughs> and they're like super into pills and stuff. Uh, they were internet celebs for a little while. Vice made them very popular. Uh, one uh, of them, well, there you go. Are they, they sh- rappers? What are they? What are no, they? No, they're not even rappers. They're just like degenerate drug guys who like to have uh, threesomes. With, with, like that's their whole thing is actually you know. Like James Franco Ew. says, uh, oh, okay. right? They're just degenerate. Like I, I don't know where they so come from. Two two twin brothers that actually do like to share. They share women. They had a, the same girlfriend for a while, so it's weird because it Ugh. blends the internet reality and it, they, oh, it shows them watching like Kimbo Slice fights when they're in the dorms right. too. Um, so there's the internet culture is already permeating, and this was 2013. This film came out. There was an right. interesting image with the ATL twin guy. He's wearing a chain and it's got a serpent's head on it. And a girl mm. is filleting the serpent's head. Uh, it shows it for part, yeah. a couple seconds, was... and it's very graphic. Yeah, um, no, they're, they're like uh, the hell hellhounds. They're like James Franco's two hellhounds, right? Like his demon dogs, right? Mm-hmm. Like Cerberus or whatever, the double-headed demon hound. And uh, James Franco is this kind of alien demon type type figure who rescues them to offer them this new way of living, right? Like, yeah. you come with me. You know, be my harem, basically, uh, and you know, I'll give you the life that you want. Because he overhears them talking about, you know, I want to live in Florida forever. I want to be a spring right forever. Yeah. Spring right forever. Well, and they get they get arrested, right? So they're they're arrested. They can't post bail, and he's sitting there all predatory, like in the uh, in the audience or whatever for their court hearing. 
Uh, and it shows his grill in this really gross reveal shot where it's like, I've got a, <laughs> the most disgusting uh-huh. mouth. Um, and then he's sitting out there. He's got this like corny ass Camaro with uh, dollar signs yeah, his, on the his, rims. You think he's going to be like this badass, but he's actually kind of just a tacky, mediocre level yeah. gangster. He's not, he's not Scarface. Right? Yeah, he's like got, he like, rents. A shitty 1990s <laughs> bed suit, you know. Uh, uh, outfit in his bedroom and his car is like a 98 like a 98 camaro or something with gay rims that have like dollar signs on them. and he's got he's got what 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 would have been a really expensive house in the 70s right yeah like 70s you know style everywhere and and if you it's funny because if you watch scarface it's kind of it's funny because in scarface when he renovates his mansion it's very tacky. Like he, it's all expensive, but it's super gaudy and tacky. Mm-hmm. And he's like a, a B grade Scarface. Like he's like a knockoff Scarface with 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 tacky shit everywhere. But he's really proud of it. He's like, I built all this. You see all this? I built all this. Is my shit. This is my shit. That's one of the best scenes. That's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Look at all my shit. Look at all this <laughs> shit. <laughs> I got Scarface on repeat. I got numb <laughs> yeah. I got sure cans. <laughs> I got sure cans. I got, got my dark tan and oil. Lay, lay down by the pool with my dark tan and oil. <laughs> but he, you know, it's it's just that scene's amazing. And he's got this, this stupid piano out by the by the, <laughs> yeah. by the pool and by the which like you know you know he saw some some rap video or some R and B video with R Kelly out by the pool playing piano. He's like, I'm yeah. gonna put a pool out by the piano. It's gonna be sweet, dog. <laughs> exactly. It's it's so funny. So what, what I thought was interesting too though is when he first meets the girls and they have their kind of reveal, um, the three girls, the three blonde chicks are pretty into him. They're just like, Yeah, this guy's mm-hmm. kinda cool. Uh, you know, they basically ask him, Well, what do you want from us? What do you want? He's just like, I just want a party. <laughs> and then he, he asks Faith her name. He's like, What's your name? And this scene is actually a very horrific scene. And when he's talking to ATL twins or sitting across from him, he says, mm-hmm. like, you know what they're into, right? They, they have double penetration. It's just really gross. Like, and he, he graphically describes their sexual um, desires, and then they're smiling at him and licking their grills and stuff. And then he asks Faith, he says, what's your name? She tells him Faith. He's like, oh, that's interesting. Like, you know, you, you believe in God. You got faith. Like, very, very aggressively, right? And she's like, uh... Yeah, he's like, you did a lot of praying. You pray for your friends here. You do a lot of praying for your friends here. She's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, you know, I was thinking. <laughs> he's like, I maybe that I'm the answer to your prayers. Maybe I'm the answer <laughs> to your prayers. So he's like, steps in and just openly takes the Luciferian kind of, you know, satanic, yeah. like, I'll, I'll replace God for you. Um, I'll answer all your prayers. Uh, and then, yeah, then, I ain't from this planet. I ain't from this planet. I'm from this planet, y'all. <laughs> But they go to they go to his uh, his pad. They go to his pad, and I think that's one of the funniest scenes is when he he shows them his house. And he's also got his tattoo is significant because it's a dollar sign, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what these alpha thoughts that have led Faith down this path. That's all they're they've been after this whole time was that money, get yep. that money. Yep. Uh, and he's got the dollar sign tattoo. Um, on his neck. On his neck. Oh, and then, then he, he reveals it a, a little bit ahead of time, too, when he talks about the sharks. He says, don't go swimming at water at night. There's sharks, a lot of sharks. He says, they're predatory animals, just waiting, just waiting. Yeah, yeah, lar- larking. Larking, <laughs> they that's larking. right. They lurking. They lurking. sharks yeah. down there lurking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they lar- he says it like three times. And so, something that I thought was interesting about the film, the editing, they loop a lot of things. So there's a lot they of loop, dialogue yeah. that's looped. Good point. I was telling Jay before we started, it's like uh, it's like it was edited by Skrillex, like a rapper or like Skrillex, yeah, like mm-hmm. da, 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 exactly. So then they get in his car, they go on his ride, they're in his vehicle. He brings them to this like trap house party, right? It's <laughs> he brings them to this house uh, with these gangsters, and dudes. it's like super ghetto, dude. Yeah, and the vibe there, you know that that scene, they actually apparently shot that like those are all real gangsters. And um, and the girls were actually legitimately freaked out. Um, <laughs> I watched some of some of these interviews, and they're talking. And the the girls were, the actresses said that they were legitimately scared of James Franco. Like he w- he was always in character when they were filming, mm-hmm. and he was like <laughs> obsessive and really he was very 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 freaky to them. So yeah, they go to this trap house, and Faith freaks out. Um, he has a conversation with her. Alien tries to get her to stay. 
And then she says, no, I'm leaving. And then she leaves. She gets on the bus and, like, shows her hand against the window. It's like, oh, I'm going back to my life. So, so Faith actually gets saved from the debauchery that happens later on to a certain extent. I thought that was interesting. You know, in a very satanic movie, the one character that, even though she has kind of a distorted connection to reality, she does, she leaves this fake world. Yeah, she was right. She knew that this wasn't going to go well. Um, but what's interesting is that the real villains aren't who you think. The real villains aren't Gucci Mane, and they're not alien. Mm-hmm. The the real hard demons turn out to be other than what you think. Yeah, yeah. So when you first see Alien, you kind of he's like basically the Satan character, right? This guy seems like he's pure evil, and he's so hokey. He's kind of funny, but also really he is right. He's he's corny, yeah, super corny. But then there there's something about that the performance that's just. I mean, I'm not a fan of like I think James Franco's pro. You know, he seems like he's kind of a degenerate and. Uh, in reality, but he did put on a really good performances in this. Yeah. Just artistically, he did a great job. Um, and then let's see what happened next. Do you remember what happens next? They, uh, they, they, let's they, they see. Go to his house, uh, right? We introduced to we're introduced to Gucci Mane. Gucci Mane is the big time gangster. He's got the actual estate, whereas you know, Alien is a mid level, mid tier gangster. Gucci Mane's got the biggest state. He gets in his face, says, I brought you up, dog. I own these streets. I own these streets. Yeah, I own these motherfucking and streets. You can tell the aliens resenting him. Alien wants, you know, to be the big dog. He's jealous of him. He wants to be running the streets. But, you know, he's too scared to do anything. And so uh then we have this sequence where he's he's trying to basically get that get the gumption up to, to do something. And he's still scared. Gucci Mane pulls up and shoots his car and a stray bullet hits one of those chicks in the arm. And that's almost enough to send him over. But then his, his, the two, uh, the, 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 that shit goes home, right? Then she, yeah. Leave too. Yeah. So they were, well, like, I'm out of this. I got a bullet. Weird, right? Yeah. So she ended up marrying huh. him. I think she's still married to him. They have a kid. Um, huh? Yeah. So then he, uh, aliens like, all right, that's enough, that's enough, and the two remaining hoes basically have to sleep with him, and you know, sort of build him, build up his his prowess, right? Well, they, it seems like they to get him because because they want him to do it. They're the yeah. ones that are really wanting him. They want to demonically influence him in a certain way. Like they they're constantly exactly. trying to egg him on, and they think it's just entertainment. Well, you think he's the predator. That's what the thing is. And those two chicks are the real predators. And you start to get that. And he almost legitimately looks scared when they grab the guns and make him suck the guns. That That's he, one of the most horrific parts, right? So it's, He actually looks starts looking scared. Like, whoa. Yeah, but <laughs> then he loves the it. Predator. Then he's like, ooh. like, And then he tells him, I, y- y'all my soulmates. <laughs> so, yeah. So now he's got a new set of uh, hellhounds <laughs> to, mm-hmm. to, to, to work with him. Uh, and then the irony, I don't, I don't know what to make of the Britney thing other than here we have Britney, another Disney princess, right? Who's turned into these, one of these mind control hoes, uh, you know, horror Babylon type things where she goes from innocent princess to horror Babylon and they're all singing Britney songs. And by the way, there's yeah. at least two Britney songs that come up in the movie. Well, so it, it's, there's the scene. All right. So they go to his house. But it, it, it skips around in time a little bit, right? Because it's just yeah, the it two girls are in his bedroom, and he's showing them, he's showing them all his stuff. Right, maybe can you play audio, like brief clips of audio from films without getting demonetized? Uh, I'll do ten seconds. Let's see. Franklin's here. We take off. Take it off. Take off. Take it off. Look at my shit. Look at my shit. I got my blue Kool Aid. <laughs> I don't know if you could hear that. I don't know if the audio goes through Skype when I do that. But he's he's jumping on his bed, and his bed is full of money. His, his bed is filled with money, and he's got these two young girls with him. And they love it. And he's got guns and money all over his bed, guns and uh, and weapons all over his walls. And he's jumping around in this, like, ecstatic state talking about his spiritual, his spiritual realm, which is just all his shit. <laughs> Look at my shit. 
So I thought I thought this was one of the best scenes in the film, and it just he's going mm-hmm. through all his weapons and his guns and his money and his uh, Calvin Klein. He's like, I got Calvin Klein escape. <laughs> I smell nice. <laughs> and he squirts it like twenty times of both of them. He's like, you could even mix them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like, take Calvin Klein escape, Calvin Klein B, and he sprays it both on them. Uh, it shows all his his caps, all his hats that still have the stickers on it, all of yeah. his sneakers. He's like, I got shorts every color. <laughs> He's like, I color shorts. I got, I got shorts. His, just his accent is so funny, and it's like you're cracking up watching the scene. But at the same time, it's like that is the millennial MTV dream, right? You know, a bunch yeah. of a bunch of weapons and money and uh, and bitches. I got my bitches. I got my shit. I got my possessions. Uh, but it really is home. It's very. It's there's nothing cool about it. The bed looks like, uh, you know, Scarface's. You know, some 1980s. Yeah, it's, it's out of date. It's uh, it's it's if you come if you're if you're in Florida, you see a lot of those kind of houses that were you know they were probably a million dollars back in the 70s, and they're now they're all kind of run down. They look kind of nasty on the ocean, and the property would still cost a lot, but you know the houses are pretty gross. So, mm-hmm. you know, he, he's he's definitely in his mind, he's way above what he actually is, and. It's funny too when he talks about his rap career when he's describing who he is. He's like, he's like, oh no, I sell drugs, but but he's like, but you see my YouTube videos, I'm about to blow up. On yeah. YouTube. <laughs> up on YouTube, he's like, like, I stand in front of all these people, like I swear to God, they it's sing humbling. My songs to me. He's like, I swear to God, it's humbling, y'all. You know, which I thought that was a funny moment because you know when people usually say, yeah, it was humbling. It's usually when they're humble bragging. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like it was so humbling, like having these people worship me. Um, I'm about to blow up on YouTube. I'm yeah, about, about to blow, to blow up. up. Got my song on YouTube. What was the song called? Like Hanging with the Dope Boys or something? Something dumb, <laughs> yeah. Some like trap song. The, the music sounds dope, exactly. Dope, dope, yeah. Hanging with the Hanging Dope with Boys. Hanging with the Dope Boys, right. <laughs> so then he starts jumping around in ecstasy, <laughs> grabbing his gun and saying, I'm going to kill that motherfucker. I'm going to kill that motherfucker. And the girls are like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. we love it. And then the girls. And then they're, then, he's, then they're like, you're scared. You're scared. You're scared. Yeah, what 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 are you gonna do? When are you gonna, what are you gonna do about it? He starts. Oh no, he, he takes the money, and he like puts it up next to her face, and she's like, says something about like, I this makes my pussy wet or something like the money makes mm-hmm. my pussy wet, which was just it's so cringy. The, every one of the girls' lines, it's like you want to cringe. I think earlier in the film when they first stole the money, one of them said like, it makes my tits look bigger. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like really funny lines like the, this money makes my kids look now the dialogue was very base very very degenerate very dumb uh which is a little off-putting because you think is the dialogue did he write it that bad or is he just literally trying to describe how idiotic 18 year olds would be talking you know what i mean mm-hmm. yeah i i think i think it was intentional like it's intentionally yeah. corny the acting is intentionally like when the girls deliver lines they are just repeating shit they heard on TV, right? There's nothing yeah. coming from their soul. They're not speaking from their true uh, self. It's just, you know, saying shit that they heard. The money makes my tits look bigger. <laughs> it's like there's nothing. And it's very unattractive, right? They're, it's very yeah. off-putting, and they're, they're destroying themselves They're physically. gross NPCs, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, and then the chicks, they, they take his guns, and, they, and he's like, that's loaded, y'all. And they put it. They put the gun up to his head, and they're like, how do you know? What do they say to him? They say, like, how do you know we're not just gonna, we're not just here to take all yeah. your shit? How do, right. you, how do you know that we're not? Here, let's see. I'll play the audio from this, from this part. Okay. This. Fucking at you. You, you think that you can just fucking own us? You think you can just fucking own us, they say? Open huh? your mouth. And then they say, open your mouth, and they, they put the guns in his mouth, and they force him to, like, Perform sexual acts on the guns. It's a really, really gross scene. Very hard to watch. Like, it's one of the more horrific scenes in yeah, the I movie. Yeah, I turned away. It was a bit much. I mean, it was gross. It was, it was a lo- it's out. really disgusting. And then it cuts to them, him at the piano, and they've got pink. <laughs> <laughs> their outfits. Do you remember what they're wearing in this in this uh, music video? Yeah, the, the, on the on their butts of the of the of the uh, sweatpants. It says deep down to. DTF. DTF, right? There's like this. And they've got shorts. pink toboggans over their face. Yeah. So they got the DTF pants, and they're wearing a unicorn pink um, ski masks, and they've got guns. Yeah. And they sing a Britney Spears song, and then it's this. It's basically a music video of these girls and James Franco 
uh, performing acts of violence and robbing just like normal Americans, right? So there's a wedding. It's, it's almost like it's it's in the mind. What what in the minds of those people, they would think, you know, making it up the the ladder, you know, social climbing, play, doing the game, you know, that, like in their minds, that's how they think it is. It's like in a music video. Mm-hmm. And it, like it, that's how you get to the top. And it's literally a music video. So they're dressed up in all their brand new sneakers, of <laughs> like bright hot sneakers and their their starter caps or whatever and they they're um you know just pistol whipping people and <coughs> the uh they go to a wedding and they they smash this dude into the cake and it's just this really corny music video. Yeah, they go on a spree of basically they start robbing people on spring break and people having parties, right? mm mm-hmm. Mhm. You know what, Jay? Let me let me re- let's reestablish the Skype call because I'm getting like audio interference. Let me just restart the Skype call real quick. Uh. All right, there you are. So yeah, and it, it, that sequence ends with them. Uh, sitting in somebody else's house, looking at three dudes tied up in a bed, and yeah. they're uh, and they're smoking a joint and just like looking really cool with their guns and squinty eyes and looking hard in a music video. Um, I I don't know what to make of that sequence, but it's kind of it's kind of haunting, like the way it was shot and the camera angles, and it it's done cinematically really well with this really corny Britney Spears song. Um, yeah. But there's something that was kind of like haunting about it. Well, it's it's the fulfillment of her line at the beginning. You got to be don't be scared of nothing. You got to act like you in a movie. Act like you're in a video game. You got to be hard. <laughs> and then here it is, right? Right. So I mean, it's it's funny. It's like you know the whole millennial world, what they aspire to, what we've been taught uh, since we were little kids to look forward to is just you know material possessions, uh, money, guns, drugs, and hoes. And the irony, of course, is that it's not really real. I mean, the story is over the top. Yeah, it, it's it's over the top in the same way as rap videos are over the top. You know, they're they're egregiously over the top, right? They're um, my allergies are bugging me. I'm not snorting coke. I'm not doing no spring breakers style. No, lifestyle. you're not hanging out with uh, Riff Raff over there in South Florida. <laughs> uh, peppermint tent, my peppermint tent. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, so the movie itself is over the top. Um, I think the, 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 the ending is, and, and it's interesting that, that it's Gucci Mane. It's, it's a over-the-top rapper who is the lead gangster yeah. who is callously, coldly just assassinated at the end. You know, we've seen this in rap, you know, to a large degree, many rappers do get assassinated. Yeah, well, they hype um, them up, right? So they hype up James Franco, and then they go to strip clubs and stuff. They do all the corny rap video shit, and then right. they finally convince him, you got to go kill this guy. you got to kill your you got to kill Gucci Mane. And the, the irony there is James Franco's dead right away. <laughs> like, he gets shot right when they get on. <laughs> yeah. Right when they get, as soon as they're walking onto the, the plank of uh, uh, Gucci Mane's... Uh, 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 they're on this neon bridge boat, boat right? dock. They, they pull up to his boat dock and they get as soon as he steps out james franco gets shot in the head <laughs> he's uh-huh. down yeah and then they're on this like big neon bridge and uh james right. franco gets shot they, do they turn around and look or do they just keep running like they didn't see they just care. keep running they, they give him a kiss when they're coming out but they just keep going yeah take they take down all of gucci Mane's guards and, it, and they just they don't even look they just point they the just guns break. around and the, and the guys everyone falls right all these dudes fall they break into Gucci Man's room. Gucci Mane's room, and he's there with his two. He's got like two he's got hose. His, he's in his hot tub, and he's got two hoes in the shower. He's watching. Yeah. And, and uh, they just, brrrap, and it's over. They run out, give James Franco a kiss, and head out. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the film it the film cold. closes with the film closes with the two uh, most wicked predators. Driving Gucci Mane's Maserati or whatever it was. <laughs> so the two <laughs> the two Disney princesses, uh, yeah. raised on the pop culture. The only things they consume in this entire film, it never shows them eating any real food. They're just smoking weed, doing coke. It's just it's just pills, drugs. Yeah, and uh, they ate Fruit Loops one time. That's what I noticed. They, <laughs> one time they consume Fruit Loops, but then they're you know they're blowing weed smoke into each other's mouths. They're just getting uh, fucked up the whole movie. Um, 
And then did you, they also, in the last scene, when they're leaving, they're talking to their parents on their cell phones. Oh, and they, yeah. And, and they're talking about how they want to be better, and which is all bullshit. Yeah. It's all lies. Like, I just, I can't wait to come home. I, I've learned so much here. It's like the I most. I want to be a good girl now. Yeah. It's the most spiritual place I've ever been in my life and stuff like saying these really corny things that are so juxtaposed to what the actions that they're taking are. Um, and it's, it's, it's like horrific. You, you're seeing these girls in there. They're talking to their parents on the phone. The people who are funding their whole operation have no idea how demented and destroyed they are. Um, they go and they, you know, they kill all the, the black characters in the film. And these two little uh, pampered chicks go back to their dorm room with the Maserati from Gucci Mane. And um, then they're just they're, they're fine with it. They don't look guilty at all. They're not freaked out. It's just here, here's what we are. Yeah, the, the total moral abandon, no compunction, no sense of guilt, and the, the complete double think, the ability in their own minds to call home, say that they're good girls and they want to do much better, they want to get back to being a good girl the way they used to be, and then they, they murder a bunch of people <laughs> and have no guilt about it and don't even care. Right? They're just like continuing on, uh, I think speaks to that's his portrayal of the dangers and degeneracy of the millennials, just like kids was a portrayal of the dangerous and degeneracy of my generation, Gen X or whatever. It's, it's, it's very parallel to kids. It's almost like the, the same type of, of film kids is about, you know, this group of friends that, that have, you know, total moral, no moral, uh, compass, no, no compunction. Uh, and then one of them even, if I recall, doesn't he? He gets off basically on spreading AIDS. Isn't that the point? Is like he doesn't even care that he has AIDS. He's gonna spread no, yeah, STDs. He care at all. AIDS. Where he, I think, no, he doesn't know, but he doesn't want to know, right? Oh, uh, that's right. He doesn't want to know. He's just keep, just, just who cares? Telly, yeah. right? That was his name. Was Telly? Telly, right? exactly. And then Casper is the other guy, and Casper ends Casper up finding Telly. out at the end. So, like he learns, right? Doesn't he learn? Someone yep. tells him, and then. He wakes up and then after he goes the party. To, he goes. Doesn't he go ahead and screw that girl anyway? That's what. Yeah, that's what he does. Yeah. yeah. So he, he doesn't care. He's always talking about I don't use no condom, man. Like he's just like I'm sick yeah. with it, yo. Um, they're all just you know skateboarding around and they steal beer and shit. And I think the last scene of that film is him waking up and saying, "What the fuck happened?" And um, yeah, af- after just this night of infecting somebody with uh, with HIV, uh, or no, he 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 would have gotten HIV, right? It's something like that. It's been I, I I haven't seen it since it came out. It's a, that's but, another but, horror movie. Like, it's actually it one is of the most a horror scary movie. Yeah, and, and so so is this. It's just two different generations of of you know how they how they have, were corrupted by pop culture, drugs, degeneracy, uh, temptation, essentially. Yeah. In uh, in that regard, yes, it it is a telling film. I just don't. It's kind of like the same. It's the ending of. Uh, of under the silver lake like what exactly does he mean by this ending does he mean that there's no hope for that generation that they're just basically abandoned to moral nihilism or or what how do you how do you read that ending for screen breakers yeah I, I just pulled up the last shot so the last shot uh well they're in the car and then the last shot is james franco's dead body the camera's upside down for some reason the angle's upside down they kiss him with their fake pink ski mask on that has a unicorn on their th- on their third eye um mm, and then they walk point. off in their bikinis across a neon bridge uh and that's the last shot i think i think basically what he's saying is that the driving force well first of all it's like james franco gucci Mane, all these hard-ass gangsters are not the real demons in the film these two girls right. are, are actually literal demons and there's a reference to it which we forgot to talk about earlier when uh Faith is talking to her friends. They're like, "You gotta watch out for them girls. They got demon blood." Oh, that's right. That the 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 redneck chicks in her hometown. They're like, "Don't go down to Florida with them. They got demons in them." I'm a, I'm gonna pray for you. I'm gonna pray real hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. You know, it's like so. Yeah, about that part. Yeah. So they they kill their own. You know, this guy that comes to save them. They basically their whole thing is about baiting. Um, James Franco into it, uh, taking all his possessions, taking his life, destroying all the lives around them. So I think it's basically just saying that the driving force behind like the whole pop culture degeneracy destruction, um, 
he's showing that it it permeates through the little girls. Like it's not the hardcore yeah. gangsters that are destroying America. It's these little girls that are consuming the pop culture. And really yes. what, what they're influenced by is the pop culture imagery, is the right. cereal box map, just like uh, – what's his face? Uh, Andrew Garfield and the other right. film. So that's what drives their behavior. So I think ultimately it's about the demonic and spiritual nature of pop culture and what it's it is, meant yeah. to do. And it's meant to commercialize, commoditize, and um, – ultimately cannibalize all these other yeah. little subcultures and um, right. and spit out people as a product. Yeah, instead of scripture as a map, instead of the Bible as a map, tradition and heritage that we've had as these maps, now your map is something that your mind creates out of pop culture, whether it's a Zelda map or whether it's you know a video game quest or whether it's the quest to become immortal through partying in spring break you know, locales or to become a rapper and, you know, ascend into the, mm. the stardom of, of rapper nonsense. You know, it's all, it's all fake. It's Spring all built on break forever. <laughs> y'all. Spring break forever. That's what, yeah, that comes up a lot in the film too. And, and, uh, Alien says that three or four times at one point. So spring, right, forever, spring, right, forever. And then the girls, I think one of the last lines that they say might be spring break forever, bitches. They yeah, say, it, and it sounds so corny when they say it, right? It's like, but that's how they spring live. Spring forever, right? bitches. Yeah. Right? They, they live in, they, they speak in tweets. They speak in Facebook posts. Exactly. Even when they're right, talking right. to their mom, it's like this false, you know, their voice sounds a little different. It sounds really corny. It sounds forced. It sounds fake. And that's intentional. Fake, yeah. He could have gotten good performances out of them and say those things like they mean it, but it's meant to sound false. It's meant to sound like there's yeah. three layers right. of bullshit in between um, the characters and their actions. Yeah, so lying to others and lying to yourself. That's another another theme there, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and it kind of spiritual deception too, right? Where it's like the audience thinks that Alien is the, dev the devil character, right? You think Alien's right. this, oh, he's the devil, he's Satan, but it really turns out that these little 18 year old girls fed pop culture uh raised on you know fruit are more wicked beer. than alien yeah yeah right an alien and they had a completely they had a completely different upbringing you know, you know alien his upbringing unless he's all making it up i mean yeah. seems to be he really did grow up on the streets and he really was you know taught the game by gucci man and all this stuff that all seems to be really the case and these girls are sheltered they're from this small town you know they're just going to some community college or whatever they're ready to get out, and they. The irony is that they have been downloaded with the pop culture, and have it's produced a more wicked character than Alien, who actually did grow up on the streets. Yeah, they're more destructive, more violent, more dangerous, and more evil. And it's funny. Yeah, and you're right. They they go to Spring Break to consume this like as an experience, right? So they they yeah. see people like Gucci Mane, these dudes that are really living these lives in the hood, and uh, you know James Franco's character. They just, they don't care about really connecting with these people or anything. It's just about no. Consuming. They see them as extras in their rap video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they steal their car in the end. <laughs> they drive with their guns and and all that. And I, it, it's people when you watch the. Uh, I think a lot of people probably said, "Oh, it's so like what a weird movie. Why is it so corny in the end?" They just they don't get shot at all. The girls are just running around, waving guns around, and everyone falls. And it's just it's so unrealistic. Um, yeah. but that, that's the reality that they're given. They're given total false reality. Total yeah. They're false chasing, everything. they're chasing a phantasm. They're chasing an illusion. And that would be another common theme amongst both of these movies is, is chasing down something that's not going to fulfill you. That's, that's illusory. Yeah. Um, so now if you read it in that way, uh, I think you, you could see it as, as a positive, uh, assessment there. So what do you think, Harmony Corinne? Do you think Harmony Corinne's trying to trying to wake up the millennials, or do you think he's just like satanically rubbing their face in their shit and saying, "Look what you did"? It could be a mixed message there. I mean, I I've never talked to him, but uh, I, I think he's he's probably trying to do a bunch of different things at once. He probably wants to, on the one hand, have an interesting, meaningful message, but he's also got to please you know, Disney or whoever funds the films, but he's also got to, you know, he's got to try to skate between Scylla and Charybdis. So, yeah. you know, it's similar to any, anybody who has a big name, you know, bunch of stars in the, in the film. It's, it's hard to figure out what their motivations are, but, yeah. um, you know, I don't, I don't know. 
I seemed, guess I have to look and see what some some of what he says in interviews probably, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I remember when I first saw the movie, I did look at some of that and looked at some of the promotional material. And it was oh, funny. you did? Yeah, but what I remember is he was going for, well, I mean, I, he didn't really say exactly what he was doing, but he seems like a very intelligent guy, um, mm -hmm. very, very, very intelligent, knew exactly the aesthetic and stuff that he wanted, and he, he sought out this cinematographer the same have you seen into the void it's horrible terrible horror film yeah i've also, seen it that movie is freaky uh, also it is pretty freaky yeah the cinematographer that did that did this movie so i think that's oh, why you okay. see a lot of the same colors and right and stuff like that um what was interesting about like the promotional stuff um they tried to promote this to millennial kids and teenagers as hot sex drugs rock and roll spring break movie and right the reaction was that everyone who saw the movie hated it, right? They thought it was, they thought right. they were going to see pop culture, like, oh, it's going to be this cool movie with boobies. And they went and it was just horrific. Yeah. You know, it was this very, this very, very terrible movie, um, intentionally corny, intentionally um, strange. And, and I think the, the response critically was people hated it. <laughs> everyone said yeah. that this is a terrible movie. Don't go see it. Like hashtag spring breakers sucks, stuff like that. So I think that was maybe his intention, like kind of trying to, uh, I think so. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause I he knew commercially how it would be. He doesn't have control over like the trailers and this and that. And he probably right. figured how it would be marketed. And, um, yeah, it must, it must've been an interesting process making this film, but <laughs> But definitely, um, yeah, you know, very, very gaudy, right? Like very uh, tacky, yeah, yeah. And and the sex scenes are like gross, right? Anytime that there's some sexuality or kissing or something, it's like over tongue, like really, really gross. Like human contact in the film is is portrayed as violent, almost. Like all the sex is it feels violent, um, and the violence is made sexy, which is kind of, I guess that's the how they do it in pop culture these days. Yeah. Like there's no understanding of a difference between like eroticism or genuine, uh, seduction or something like that. And just really gross porn. Like it, like the whole generation was over pornographized, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, what was interesting. I know you've done some stuff on the, uh, the bronies and the, the weird subcultures and stuff. They, they're watching the only film, like on their TVs, they're watching My Little My Little Pony, and I think Care Bears, and oh, I didn't notice the Care Bears. I saw the My Little Pony stuff. I yeah, the be, Brony crop. I might be wrong about Care Bears, but I saw the My Little Pony, and then uh, Kimbo Slice Street Fights on YouTube. <laughs> it's like in the background. It's just for yeah. some reason watching the Kimbo right. Slice beat the shit out of someone in a backyard. But uh, yeah, really, really weird movie. I actually, I don't know. What, what do you? Which one did you enjoy more? Uh, Silver Lake or Spring Breakers? Well, you've uh, you've you've pulled up some points in Spring Breakers that I I missed, so um, I'm rethinking some of the elements of it that I missed that I that I didn't catch that first because I've only seen it once. Yeah, uh, I, I like Under the Silver Lake a little bit better just because of the depth and the the Twin Peaks and old Hollywood references. That's and I I kind of feel like an Andrew Garfield type of character. Mm. Not that I'm a listless millennial, but uh, I'm right on the edge of you know Gen Z and millennial. And you're really uh, into older women. Like grannies. I, I live with a naked hippie. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, a naked boomer hippie. No, uh, um, and I like to tend birds. <laughs> there's, there's 20 bird cages shitting, birds shitting everywhere. No, um, yeah, I, I like that it was, uh, you know, he's basically decoding Hollywood. Um, and he doesn't know how to process it. And it's an ambiguous ending. But, you know, the synchromistic you know, connections and, and the weird stuff behind the pop culture. It's all true. Yeah. You know, what we're going to do with that is a different question, but it's, it's all there. There's no question that the movie makes it clear that it is true. You know, he kind of gives up. Is that the right response? I don't know, but, uh, but it was fun. Uh, we'll have to do another one of these. We'll pick out a couple more movies. I'm gonna have to go here pretty soon. But... Yeah. Yeah. I gotta get out of here too. I'm, I'm, uh, I've been sitting down too long. My back hurts. Um, yeah. cool, man. Hey, that, that was fun. I like this. It's, I've wanted to do movie reviews at some point, but it's so it, it's hard to do it on your own. We got a we got a little Siskel and Ebert. Yeah, thing. it's better when there's two people. And and you you've you notice and pick up things I miss. So yeah, so likewise. it's always good to have two to have two eyes on something, four eyes on something. All right, so I got a suggestion for the next one. You probably already know because I've been bugging <laughs> you about this one already. So it ties in with 
the same theme with um you know the the following the white rabbit down the uh the whole um, three i'm um, three episodes into utopia if that's what you're gonna say exactly so um awesome so we'll do utopia next once we'll you finish utopia. that series okay. i think i think there's 12 episodes um yeah and it's yeah it's easy to watch because there's a captivating story uh, but we'll do that next. So you guys can find more at uh, jaysanalysis.com. I got to say, if you're not already subscribed uh, to jaysanalysis.com, you got to become a subscriber. He uh, Not only does he do a lot of you know pop culture analysis and stuff to uh, to bring the kids in, to bring the the, uh, the views, you got to get the clicks. But you know what? He just does some of the most incredible theological um, analysis of modern culture. And as well as just, he breaks down some of the old Church Fathers books, and uh, he does a Globalist book series that's really good. His website and his YouTube channel, I mean, he's, he's giving you like university-level um, theology lectures for free on YouTube almost every other day. And I can't even keep up with it. I sometimes have to listen to his lectures twice to, uh, to really understand what... Uh, uh, the deep truths that he's uh, getting to there. So make sure to check out. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, check out jaysanalysis.com and check out his, uh, got to subscribe to his channel as well. And then, Jay, do you and have by any- the way, <clears throat> if you're listening on my channel or at, at uh, my audio podcast series or whatever, if you're on iTunes and you're hearing this, uh, definitely check out Primal Edge Health too. I need to pr- promote your stuff. I mean, uh, since we've been doing shows, I've been going back, I've been watching your episodes that you do and you've been cranking out interviews. I listened to the interview you did with Bobby. That was really fascinating where you got into his history with, you know, his views on veganism, how he's evolved on that issue. Um, I've listened to, uh, the interview you did with Carnival. So I've been, I've been catching up on your stuff and there's a lot of good stuff you're doing there too. Oh, thanks man. Thanks. Yeah. It's, uh, it's fun. You know, we've got, we've been through a lot of different, uh, incarnations of the channel um and uh, over the years but i like i like the direction we've been going lately it's more fun when i first started out the first few years it was basically just like hey it was basically just me on my porch grab the camera usually don't have a shirt on because i live in ecuador and it's always nice and hot so uh, most of my old videos are just me talking about nutrition and food and diet and stuff but i've been enjoying um the live streaming thing ever since this came yeah, out yeah live streaming is a great it's a blast it's That's really good i'm really glad I, hopefully we can keep live streaming and we don't get kicked off of youtube uh too soon but um yeah we'll we'll do this again maybe once you finish uh utopia we can review utopia okay. and talk about that cuz that definitely ties in a lot with the nutrition stuff we talk about on this channel as well remember guys it's it's it not does just because yeah the, the third episode now they're talking about the food company being involved in the conspiracy uh-huh yeah and I think they even get a little bit deeper later on. They should, they have some good okay. shots of the cornfields when they're talking about that, right? Right. Like they flash to right. the cornfields. So yeah, Utopia. That was a series, 2013 and 14, and in, uh, in the UK. That's what we're going to talk about next. So if you guys haven't seen the Utopia series from Channel Four UK, check that out. We'll do that, and uh, maybe next week we'll get to it. And uh, if you have any other suggestions of movies we can do esoteric analysis of, definitely. Um, Definitely let us know. Well, oh, you know what? J- Jay, do you have time to answer this question? This is my friend Andrew Scarborough. He's a really cool sure. guy. He's So Andrew Scarborough, he's a cancer survivor. He had a brain tumor, and he uses a ketogenic carnivore diet to keep uh, from having seizures all the time, and it works mm-hmm. pretty dang well. He says, what do you think of the Daniel fast, theologically and otherwise? Uh, I remember reading about this a long time ago. Um, I'm sure there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I, I would say that's a, a profitable thing, probably. There you go. There you go. So, yeah, the book of Daniel is really interesting. Um, yeah. Cool. So, One everybody. Of my favorites. Nice. Nice. Didn't you, isn't Daniel your, uh, your, your patron saint? It is. Yeah, I chose Daniel. Correct. Nice. Nice, man. So you guys check out Utopia series. We'll, we'll do that one next. We'll talk about that one. Uh, it ties in with food, social engineering. Uh, also, media being used as. Yeah you know, kind of uh, leading people down certain paths of understanding. And uh, I think you guys will like that chat. So we'll talk about that next one. And uh, Jay, w- what else you got going on now, man? You got anything new? You know, you got a new book, right? What's up with the book? Well, yeah, you definitely you can get uh, signed copies of Esther Hollywood 2 in my shop at Jay's Analysis. You can get part one as well. Um, everybody's uh, orders are out, so they're all caught up. Um, yours went out probably about a week ago. My brother got it. Uh, yeah, he's going to bring it to me. I'll have it on next week. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, so yeah, everybody's is in the mail. Sorry that it took longer. I, I ran out really quick the first batch. So, 
they were sold in three or four days. So I had to wait until I came back to Florida and got a whole new batch of books. But anyway, so they're all, it's all good now. Um, all pretty much five star reviews so far. Uh, I think nine people have reviewed it and 4.5, 4.5 out of five. So, there you go. Uh, so don't get it from Amazon it though, for. right? You don't want people no, buying it. Don't from pay Amazon. Jeff Bezos. If you want to get it, get it from me. It's a little bit more, but I'll sign it. And um, next coming up, uh, I'm, I'm about uh, a third of a way into a video I'm making and the, the style of the Eye of the Devil video, That since that video did pretty good. This one's going to be about um, a recap of like the pop culture ceremonies that we've been given. So uh -huh. going back to Tim Leary, going back to the 60s, looking at big mass ceremonies, you know, coming from that period all the way up to Super Bowls, Olympics, yeah. you know, this, these degenerate ceremonies. That, that tunnel, like, that tunnel we, we, ceremony, everybody. The tunnel, the sweet, the Gutten, Gutenberg tunnel, the, uh, the Swedish tunnel, everyone, that one's in there. Um, because we forget about these ceremonies, like we forget, cause they just crank them out. And then, you know, this year it's, Oh, what's this year's Super Bowl garbage about what's this year's VMA is about. I wanted to recap these cause I've never really covered those in depth, mm -hmm. give my analysis of them. But have it in, you know, like a 30, 40 minute uh, mini documentary style. So I'm yeah. about a third of the way done with that. It should be out in the next few days. Oh, that's awesome, dude. Yeah, it, it's interesting how these ceremonies and these mass events, people don't even understand right. kind of the, the cultural roots and the, you know, the spiritual roots of these these things and why they're done you know i mean you get thousands of people in one area chanting something right. like these <laughs> these have powerful effects on yeah. human consciousness and uh yeah that'll be good man i look forward to that one so you guys make sure to ch uh, subscribe to jay's channel i'll pin in the pinned comment on this uh video will be jay's website and his channel so check him out there and check out his book esoteric hollywood too i'm sure it's great i haven't seen it yet i haven't gotten my copy yet but i'm excited to read it so thanks jay all right man all right god bless have a good day